video camera is? No, you can be anywhere. All right, good, because I usually walk around. <laughs> one, so I'm just going to take the freedom to do that. Um, thank you, Jesse, uh, and congratulations to, to the student groups, the National Lawyers Guild, BALSA, Criminal Law Society, um, and any other groups that are putting this program together for Justice Week. It's really a terrific program. We have a great speaker for today, so I'm not going to go on for, for, for very long. But, um, but I, do want, I did want to say a couple of things. Um, you know, we are the only public law school in the Commonwealth. And as the only public law school, we take that identity really seriously. And part of what it means to be the public law school, and part of what our, our mission is here, is focusing on access to justice. And a big part of access to justice is access to a meaningful legal education. And we take uh, the diversity in our student body really seriously. It's front and central in our uh, marketing materials right next to Bar Pass. Right, our uh, entering class in 2015 uh, was the most diverse, the highest percentage of students of color of any law school in New England, and we were really close to that same mark um, in 2016 and 2017. And, um, you know, it makes a big difference. I know for those of you who've been in law school classrooms, diversity in the classroom makes a big difference. Uh, I can tell you just from my own experience, I don't get to teach currently, um, but uh, even just in the, in, the, in the brief time that I was teaching here, there have been instances in which the fact that there was diversity in the classroom changed what I taught and changed the way that I looked at the material that, we were, that I was teaching. I'll give you two examples, unless the first one takes a long time. Then I'll <laughs> right? um, but uh, my first year teaching here, I was teaching a case that I had taught for 14 years. Same case, same case book. Um, and it involved uh, the sale of a car in the 1960s in uh, the upper Midwest. It was Minnesota, 1960-something. It was the winter time. The guy bought the car, uh, the plaintiff, and uh, complained that the car was advertised as having air conditioning. And so, uh, you know, and the, the court ruled against the plaintiff. They held in favor of the defendant. Then they said, uh, the court said that uh, while the plaintiff had the car out for a 90 minute test drive, it would have been obviously discoverable whether or not the car had air conditioning. He had a chance to, 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 to check whether or not the car had air conditioning, and so he couldn't recover. And so, you know, in this very sort of <coughs> jocular way, I always call on a student from the upper Midwest, right? And I always say, okay, so if you were driving a car in Minnesota in March, and there's a button that says air, and you press the button, right? What's gonna happen? Cold air is gonna come rushing out at you, right? And so the court got it wrong, right? It wasn't obviously discoverable. Right? And so, my first year teaching here, a hand goes up, and it's a guy who's probably 10 years older than me, and he says, Professor Mitnick, did you ever, ever see a car from the 1960s with air conditioning? And I said, no, I never saw one. And he said, well, if you had, you'd know the court was right, because air conditioning in cars in the 1960s, they weren't incorporated into the dash in the way they are today. Instead, it's this big honking like refrigerator thing that goes under the dash that you'd bang your knees on, <laughs> right? And so it's clearly obviously discoverable whether or not you would. And so, you know, the fact that there was somebody in the classroom who had more <laughs> life experiences than any of us uh, made a big difference. Um, and the next year, and I think some of people in this room might have been in the class for this one. I'll, I'll tell you briefly. The next year I was teaching defamation. And I was teaching the doctrine that sometimes in uh, defamation, the, the, the plaintiff is, their, their reputation would be harmed among a group that is considered so antisocial or so contrary to social norms that they shouldn't be able to recover. And the example, the paradigmatic example, is the idea um, of uh, the criminal. Bob the criminal cooperated with the police, right? Now think about that for a second. It's false, 
Who's going to look down on Bob? Right? His fellow criminals. They're not, in my, you know, 1960s mentality of uh, cops and robbers, they're not going to let him be the getaway guy, you know, getaway driver in, 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 in their, in their, in their plans anymore, right? So his reputation would only be harmed among, among criminals, and so, according to the doctrine, shouldn't be able to recover. And then a hand went up, and a woman in the back row said, what if everyone in the community distrusts the police? And I was kind of, it was a real challenge. I hadn't thought about that for a second. But it really showed me, I mean, what if this was Baltimore or Ferguson, Missouri, or you know, any of the other places in which there's been um, abuse, where there's been a uh, real clash between the community and police, and where the plaintiff's reputation would be harmed not just among the group of criminals, but of the community as, as a whole. And so it showed me the fact that we had a person of color in the classroom who came from a community where there was this sort of experience showed me that um, the doctrine had to be much more contextual, right? So um, we take diversity very seriously, and, it, and, and it, it's not just a matter of diversity for diversity's sake, but here in legal education, it makes a real difference to the education that you receive. Um, I will, I'll, I'll close with this. I, I went, I had the good fortune to go, I think it was last week, to the uh, MLK, the Martin Luther King breakfast. Sean King spoke. Uh, at the breakfast, and two things he said stuck with me. Um, several things, but two things that I'll mention. Um, the first was, he, he showed a chart of um, incarceration of people of color. And the chart, right around 1970, it just went like this. It was like you were out in western Massachusetts going over these rolling hills and suddenly drove into Mount Everest, you know? I mean, it was just, and we're still up there, right? Up there. Now, why 1970? Well, his, his theory was that this was right after um, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts were passed. And so, at the same time, as just as soon as people might have had meaningful right to vote, there is mass incarceration of those same people, right? That's the first thing uh, that he said. The second thing that he said that really stuck with me was, he, he said, you know, we, sometimes we think about what we would have done at different times in history. Like, what would we have done during the abolitionist movement? What would we have done during a genocide? What would we have done during the Civil Rights era? Right? Would we have been active or would we have been <laughs> passive? Would we maybe have sat there and um, been critical of what's going on? Would we have been sympathetic, empathetic, but not done anything? And he said, you know what? Looking at the mass incarceration rate today, things are not good in America today. And what you're doing today is probably what you would have been doing back then too. And so, think about that, right? I mean, part of what we're doing here in law school at a place where we have a strong access to justice mission is preparing students to be able to go out and do those sorts of things, okay? So think about what you can do. And anyway, that's my 10 minutes, so <laughs> thank you very much. Yay, I don't have any excellent stories like oh, that. Oh, I was supposed to introduce you. Yeah, no, it's, it's fine. You did so much more. That was way better than that. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Pamerson Eiffel. He is the regional supervisor of the probation department in Region 1, which includes Fall River, the Cape, and New Bedford. Um, I actually heard about Pamerson when I was interning at Brockton Superior Court. I heard about him through the probation department. He did his implicit bias uh, presentation to them, and all of their minds were absolutely blown. There was a 55-year-old uh, probation officer who was like, there's things that he brought up I never thought of uh, when it came to race and other sort of biases that we hold. Um, this man's been a probation officer for 30 years. So I thought it would be great to have Pamerson come and talk to us now while we're law students so we're not 30 years into our career realizing that we might have some sort of implicit biases. Uh, so without further ado, here's Pamerson Eichel.
So I do a lot of presentations and I teach. I've been teaching for about 20 years. Get a little background about myself. I was born in Barbados, um, came to the United States back in 1984 to pursue an amateur boxing career. Ended up fighting out of the Petronelli's gym in Brockton. And um, while I was there, I decided I needed to do something with my free time. So I went to Massasoit, got an associate degree, and I figured I was done. And then somebody says, hey, you know, you're kind of smart guy. Why don't you go get your bachelor's? I went to Stonehill and got a bachelor's degree. Thought I was done, and my wife said, you know, you're going to need your master's, so I just went over to Brandeis Hello <laughs> School and did that. Um, so <coughs> I think for me as a probation, as a regional, so I cover everything from here right through the Cape and Islands. So when, um, for me, it's a really exciting time to be in the Massachusetts trial court as well as in the probation. As you all know, probation went through a scandal a number of years ago. Um, I think we're trying to sometimes shake that sort of Achilles heel. But at the same time, right now within the probation and service as well as the Massachusetts Trial Court, we're working through our um, mission state, um, sorry, our strategic plan. And part of that is how do we um, expand and look at diversity in different ways. And one of the things that I've been involved with over the last 18 months from the probation service is um, the development of our um, workforce diversity and cultural competence. And one of the things that we recognize and we realize we needed to do as a system, we have to get better at how we treat and address and deal with diversity at all this at all this level. So today's presentation is going to get to some of the work and meet the work that we're doing within the trial court. It's going to talk about probation. But one of the things that we're doing currently right now is rewriting the entire vision and mission statement of the trial court to make sure that we include diversity and inclusion and equity. At the end of the day, where we all want to get to be in an equitable, uh, equitable situation, and that's when we talk about delivering, the trial court speaks to talk about delivering justice with dignity and speed, but we want to make sure, you know, when we talk about justice, I was sitting in a meeting with the Chief Justice and the new court administrator a couple of weeks ago, he says, you know, when we said justice is blind, but I think she can see people of color really well. <laughs> because when you start looking at incarceration rates and sentencing rates, as the dean was just talking about, she really can't see. So this idea that justice is blind for me is a fallacy. So we'll talk about this. Um, so can I kill this front light, yeah. if you don't mind? Thank you. So in terms of head of the power, workforce diversity and cultural um, competence, there are two pieces that I had within our strategic plan. So we want to figure out how do we go about having a much more diverse workforce? How do we develop those skill sets? But at the same time, in the term of developing a diverse workforce, how do we make sure that we build internal capacity across the trial court as well as within the probation to be able to address diversity in all of its forms at the local level? So our goal is we want to infuse cultural competence. And, and we'll get into sort of some of those technical definitions to ensure equitable treatment throughout all aspects of the trial court. So the goal is, uh, you know, I like to believe, and I say this all the time, you, you know, the court officers may say differently, but I say justice begins at the front counter. And I say that from the minute somebody walks into a probation office, how you interact, how you engage, how you talk, how you speak, how you greet, how you welcome them, sets the next several months or years of their confidence or trust in how they may interact with a probation officer. So we happen to believe that if you greet people in a friendly, engaging way, if you have cultural competence or cultural understanding about who that person is, where they're from, what gratis or race, class, gender, sexual orientation, if you treat that person with a level of dignity and respect, they will always remember that as their initial engagement with the trial court as opposed to rude and dismissive or an attitude that you are better than them. And we've had that. Look, I run into that even though as a regional supervisor, I'll call courthouses, I'll go to courthouses, and I'll say somebody and they'll hear an accent. And they'll automatically be dismissive. And then I'll say, no, 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 this is Palmerston Eiffel. And they'll say, well, who are you? And I say, well, I'm a regional supervisor. And the attitude immediately changes. I've gone to courthouse and I dress like this, and man, and I like to look good. There's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> and I had a court off, a, I mean, a probation officer who was working for the system for 30 years said to me about a month after, the first time I saw you, I thought you were a pimp or drug dealer. That was his perception of me because I was a well-dressed black man, right? So, and, and that is something that isn't that unusual. 
So we're talking about the court system. Just imagine people that, who should, who should we say should know better? Just imagine folks who aren't exposed or who aren't that educated about it. But here's what we need to do. Here's what we're looking to do across the trial court. We want to make sure that all staff at all levels of our organization and trait are trained in and alert to issues of disparate treatment and access. And this is something that the trial court is struggling with. It is working through. We want to make sure we just did an access to justice survey and we realize that a lot of Latino and African American individuals see and, and perceive the treatment and the access to justice very differently from white individuals who may use the trial court. And, 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 and you don't really have to go far to see that. We look at all the time, and I'll show you some slides about sentencing here in Massachusetts. But we want to say true research and comparative performance measures, probation's goal of achieving higher levels of customer satisfaction and equitable treatment among people with a variety of differences. I know you guys are smart, so you can read as much faster than I can. <laughs> but, but part of this is we, we want to make sure that we have an organizational commitment to reducing disparity. This is the goal of the probation service. And it wasn't, these are things, imagine, we've been around since 1850 with John Augustus. It isn't until 2016, 17 that we come to the point that we need to address disparity and how we treat and, and engage folks. So how many years is that? Any math students in the crowd? I don't think so. <laughs> Anybody going into accounting law? No, maybe. Well, that would be important. But you know, so part of what we're looking to do is have in, in, introduce some corrective message to fix this. Definition of diversity, maybe this is the best one that I've found, and I've been hunting for years and decades to find out um, a definition of diversity, and this has come from the University of Oregon. It says the concept of diversity encompasses acceptance and respect, and that's where the core principle of this, regardless of what people look like, who they look like, if you have a level of respect for who they are, that's probably the central tenet in all of the aspects of accepting people that are different from you. Um, it says, um, uh, it means understanding that each individual is unique and recognizing their individual differences. These can be along the dimensions of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and you can go through all of these. Uh, it's about understanding each other and moving beyond simple tolerance. Tolerance, we tolerate our husbands and our wives and girlfriends. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, it's about embracing, taking people the whole. So Say that again. I was just commenting on your last comment. You were tolerating spouses and partners. I'm just. Sad. Uh, I said sad. So uh, hey, right. That's all I said. We, we, you know, usually, a lot of you guys will find work in divorce court. So if you, if you, if your spouse just, if you just tolerate somebody, sooner or later you're going to move to a point where there's friction. Okay. And, and even if you love people dearly, you will have that. But being able to embrace people's difference is central to the core understanding of who that person is. So if I can embrace you as opposed to just tolerate you, I'm going to have a deeper understanding about who you are, which is really what my point was. Well, no. you know, I'm a psychotherapist, not an attorney or a law student, so there you go. Different persuasion. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good, that's right. Yeah. So we want to, you know, so this is moving beyond just tolerance and really embracing people at their central core, who they are, how they identify what they like, who, who they like. All of these are things that gets into the central heart. Of, for me, I found this when I was doing a lot of research, you know, and, and we have this now placed in every probation office and across the trial court. You cannot go into a courthouse and not see the definition of diversity, or you can't say, the beauty of the world lies in the diversity of its people. So I'm um, about, a year and a half ago, I had about maybe 200 people in the room when I was given, and I walked in and I said, this is a beautiful room. And our <laughs> chief diversity experience officer was cringing, because he thought it sounded a little, you know, you know crossing that line with uh, between sexual harassment. But then I said, no, no, no. I said, no, 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 oh, here's the point of what I said when I said this is a beautiful room. We had, you know, we have a very diverse court in a, at a lot of different levels, and then at some levels we don't. So I, really what I was trying to get, the beauty of the world lies in the diversity of its people. For me, that's one of the more powerful things you're going to encounter when you start to have conversations around diversity, I, I, you know. All right, so one of the things that I like to try to figure out is, you, you know, so we talk about cultural competence. And cultural competence for me is having the, the knowledge and the understanding about what differences are, what people are. 
But we are, where we ultimately want to get, not just as a trial court or probation service, but where all we, where every individual in this room should be hoping to get, is to get over to that level where we talk about cultural proficiency. So you talk about cultural destructiveness. I would suspect that you all are lawyers, so none of you would ever even engage in that. But cultural destructiveness is you're the type of person or you're the kind of individual that you say what you think about race, class, gender, you alienate people, you marginalize people, you trivialize people. Those are the folks that we try to make sure we don't hire in the court system. And sometimes when we have issues and incidents, and some person, people will say, well, who hired that person? And I would say, we did, right? So don't be surprised that, that, that the employees that we hire are representative or reflective of the larger society with all of its powers and fabulous things, but also all of its ills. Um, so, you know, I happen to think for us, as you know, cultural destructiveness, cultural incapacity, which really, really is a demonstrated lack of understanding of differences and diversity. Where we want to get to, you know, you know, there was a time in this country where we would say, we're, well, I'm colorblind. And really, what does that mean? Because I want you to see me as me, tall, black, and handsome. That's all I want you to see. That's what I noticed when you walked in. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> like, like, I like to have fun when I present, so take it with a grain of salt, or you can take it as it is. It's all good. I don't expect to be sued <laughs> when I leave. Uh, but, 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 um, you know, so I, I tend to think a lot of us are around the level of cultural precompetence. Uh, or, or you all as a law school might be a l skilled in terms of the language of the law. The question is, are you skilled in your engagement with people that are different than you? Or do you engage people because you understand the law and you understand it in a way that if you say the wrong thing or you do the wrong thing, you could be sued? Part of what I'm talking about when we embrace people, none of those things factor into the equation. Because at cultural proficiency, you have the demonstrated capacity to work with any, engage any individual, regardless of race, class, sexual orientation, gender, doesn't matter, physical ability or physical disability. You, when, you, when you are culturally proficient, when, any, when you engage with any person anywhere from anywhere around the world, you have the capacity to work with them in a comfortable, engaging and embracing environment. And that's what we're hoping to accomplish across the trial court. It, is, it, it, it will be difficult because part of the problems that a lot of large organizations do, we have about 6,600 um, employees, is building capacity internally within an organization to deliver that. And, it, and it's going to require a lot of money, it's going to require a lot of training. But for me, the most it requires, it requires courage because it forces people to challenge old norms. So this is a great slide when you're really talking about the different levels from going from um, uh, you know, cultural destructiveness all the way over to cultural proficiency. So proficiency is a demonstrated capacity to work and engage and deal with and address of any individual that you may encounter in your daily profession or daily life. All right, so the loading group out of Florida is probably, you know, 10 years, five years ago, you could, there, there were several different de uh, definitions of what diversity is. Um, but here there are two primary and secondary dimensions. Um, the inner circle is the primary dimensions, which is the primary dimensions of, in the, are particularly important in shaping who you are. And it talks about shaping an individual's values, self-image and identity, opportunities and perception of others. We think of these as the primary dimensions, or that's the core component of who you are. So we're talking about spiritual beliefs, class, gender, physical abilities, age, race, sexuality, income, ethnicity. So when somebody says to you, when you guys see this on your next quiz, because I did send this to a couple of your professors. <laughs> 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 you know, what are the new legal definitions? No, I'm just <laughs> So this, this is really, in essence, who you are. And, and this, is, this is the thing that we're most protective of, but this is also the component that, that, that the conflicts when it gets into the outer elements. <clears throat> So secondary dimensions in the outer circle represents an essential dimension of your social identity. These are the things that we tend to acquire late in life or develop or come up against. So a family status, um, work experience, communication style, cognitive style was added recently. Political beliefs was also added recently. Education, geographic location. So this is where we find a lot of our friction, right? Our social dimensions, how we engage, who we engage, all of the things that we acquire later on in life, that sometimes we are 
great about sharing or discussing, and then there are other things that we're really protective because sometimes we tend to think that people might be attacking us because of some of these. So it is important that it says primary and second dimensions are the differences more likely to lead to culture clash and conflict when they're ignored, devalued, or misunderstood by others. So when we, this, this goes back to that original slide when I'm talking about cultural proficiency, it is, under, it, it, it is important that you demonstrate broad-based knowledge and understanding of people that are different from you. Because if you're able to do that, then it makes life a lot easier when it comes out to engaging. So in terms of the trial, or the trial court and probation, because a lot of this has been ad adapted by the broader trial court, it says the commitment to a diverse and cultural covenant must be executive and management driven, and why this is important. Management establishes the policies, the protocols, but the more, more often than not, the, part, the accountability components of this. <coughs> All across this country, organizations and institutions have said we need to do, tackle diversity. We need to address diversity. But what happens, and they all have great policies, it takes courage and commitment, but if nobody in the organization is held accountable for not either at subscribing to those goals or following through on that delivery of commitment, this is where we fall down. So when I said the idea that um, um, it has to be management and ex executive driven, manage, it sends a powerful message that we are committed to this. And unless you have management, it, it, it naturally, and, there's another component of this. It doesn't matter how good managers are. If your middle managers and your uh, supervisors aren't committed to it, you're going to struggle because at the end of the day, those are the folks that, that, that need to implement policy. So the idea when you sell diversity or when you have conversations about diversity because there's nothing that can be sold, you really have to talk about diversity and inclusion as everybody's job. Where managers and supervisors can set the policy or our executives can set the policy. It requires commitment at every level. It says the, the, the MPS will emphasize the development and embracement of a culturally competent, of culturally competent work skills and cultural understanding the central tenets of what we do. So we, um, all the time I talk about this, you know, when people come to the courthouse, I say, look, we are in the, you know, we are in the customer service business. Justice, just a, justice is just a byproduct of that. Because if you treat people with a level of dignity and respect, you know, and when I was a chief probation officer in Suffolk Superior Court, uh, there were a couple of judges, and there was this, uh, he's now on the, and I'm drawing a blank, there was a woman by the name of Judge Ball, they call her Christmas Carol, her first name was Carol Ball, because <laughs> <laughs> she would let everybody out and off. <laughs> and, and then um, there was this other judge, was, uh, you know, she's a great judge, by the way. She was a great, if you were defense counsel, that was the best judge you wanted. You, so you, you know Judge Ball? I was a public defender, and you always wanted to get in Judge Ball's session. All right, so, uh, so, so they call her Christmas Carolyn, and she was a huge fan of mine when I was in Suffolk Superior Court. But, but, you know, and then there was another judge. He says, you know, I can give a person, you know, Judge Ball can give a person 15 years, and they'd say it's a great deal. And I can give them 15 years, and they'd call me a mean bastard. And, I, and it was just an issue of perception, really, because the sentence was the same. It is how you deliver that sentence that matters, right? How you engage people, how you make people, if, how you extend a humanistic approach to justice. Um, all right, so when we talk about, again, this comes back to, again, to what we're looking to do. We want to ensure that it's focused on exceptional customer service delivery. We want to talk about a workforce that is highly qualified, racially and ethnically diverse, gender balanced. We actually, in the probation service, is tilted to the point where between 50 and 65% now of all new probation officers are female. We're running into a problem that if you're the only male probation officer in some court, some days you do not want to go to work. <laughs> Why? Because the courts have taken on a massive amount of drug testing and the majority of our probationers are about 78% of male. Right? So who am <laughs> if you are one male probation officer in a courthouse, you might be testing all, you know, you might be performing all the truck tests for probation for, for that court department. So, so we are trying to make sure that we have a, you know, there was a point where it was the other way around, but now we're looking to that we're finally seeing more women are going into the position. And, you know, talk about effectiveness at all levels of the organization. All right, so best practices in serving a diverse customer population, we got to know our clientele. And, and, and part of this is, you know, uh, we, we're trying to hire people that from those communities. The goal is we want to look like the communities we serve. 
That is an essential component. The idea of self-identification, where people walk into a courthouse and see people that look like them, may understand them, might be may be empathetic to their uh, circumstance, might have had those same lived experience. You heard the dean talking about the guy from the Midwest who was from an older generation that they could talk about old big old fridger and refrigerator in the car. Oh. <laughs> as simple as that may be, people want to people. You know, all too often we've got judges, we've got prosecutors, we've got police officers, we've got probation officers, have no relationship or correlation to the people that they're working with in this service. And there's this massive disconnect. So sentences sometimes could be absence well, of humanity, humanity, but an, a social understanding and awareness of where people, how people might have fallen into the rut or that sort of situation. Remember this, look, heroin has always been in some of our communities. Nobody really cared, and I know you all have heard this. Now we've got, because of the opioid addiction, we've got a public health crisis. Well, I'm gonna tell you this. If those were young black and brown men that were dying with the same numbers, nobody would have really cared. Nobody would have, right? And if you want to go back to the AIDS epidemic back in the early, late 70s, early 80s, until it started affecting different groups of people, nobody really cared. Had we tackled that issue way back when, we would have had a significant better health outcomes. But again, the perception of who it is. So we want to be able to recognize communication patterns. We want people that walk into the courthouse, we need to be able to speak the same language and engagement. Um, we want to be able to build relations. We want to create a welcome environment. And we want to develop culture-specific knowledge of your clients. I tell you this all the time. You know, um, I used to have a probation officer who I really was thought was a really mean dude. And I would get a lot of complaints about him, and I couldn't tell you what court it was in. <laughs> and, 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 and so he always had the difficulty in engaging young black males. And I would say to him, you know, it's really the way you engage folks. You can't go into parents' house and tell them, I'm not here to see you, I'm here to see your son. Well, you know, for, for a lot of these families, you come into my house, you better treat me with a level of respect. So I call this old Jamaican woman, she called me and says, you better tell that probation officer not to come back to my house, I'm going to cut him. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't do that, but, but that's how she, you know, I'm from the Caribbean, so really don't matter. <laughs> we, 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 you know. And so I call him and I says, hey, look, I just got this complaint from this mother that you were rude to her. And he says, you know, chief, not for not, you know, but sometimes, you know, when you get these complaints, you need to tell people that they shouldn't be complaining because they're not, they're on probation, not me. And I says, and then I said, well, really? Well, when you go to people's house, you need to treat them with respect. And then he says to me, Chief, you know, I think sometimes you like those people better than you like men. I says, on oh, some days I do. You know? <laughs> he wrote a letter to the commissioner. <laughs> and I said, yes, I did say that. Is there, there's no policy that says I could tell him my honest truth. But, you know, but. All right, so it is hot in this room, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know. uh, so, so here's our diversity commitment. It says that essentially any person who walks into a courthouse of a, a visit a probation counselor has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. They need to be entered in an atmosphere where there's an absence of judgment and bias, exposed to culturally competent and knowledgeable staff, need to be heard and understood. And this is a fundamental component of it. You've got to hear people and you've got to understand them. Whether or not you like what they did, or whether or not you, what, why they're before the court, that is irrelevant. You still need to treat them with dignity and respect. Um, the recipient of quality, quality, um, quality administrative and supervisory services are important. And, and we run into this. We have people that come in that have committed some horrendous acts. But just remember this. They are very keen at picking up how well what you think about just from your body language and from your interaction with them. It is especially important, especially with juveniles. And, and I say this because it is important that when it, you know, you gotta be professional all the time. Even when you're having a bad day or a good day, it doesn't really matter. Why? Because you're being paid to be there. It's your job. And sometimes people struggle with that component of it. It's my job, but he, he's, he, he did this, so, so what? That's why we have a court system. That's why we have judges and we have juries and we have people to render justice. You let them make the decision. The court has confidence in your ability to work and engage people at a professional level. So that is an important part of what we do in the probation service. 
So I know we hear a lot about implicit bias and unconscious bias. The term is unconscious bias now, but so we think. So look, unconscious bias. All of us in this room got it, right? I love, I love chicken. <laughs> I do. So, so when somebody says to me, you like chicken? I say, yeah, I do, but that's your bias. But I just really enjoy chicken. <laughs> right. But the unconscious bias are those things that are mixed, in, in, you, know, uh, you know, we looked at some individuals the same way, uh, in a different way. So, I mean, so, so it is important that, 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 that you recognize that, that you might be biased towards male, female, straight, gay, black, white, Asian. And you might be responding to folks and you might be doing things without consciously thinking of your engagement, right? I go to stores sometimes and, you know, you're walking down the aisle and people will be stepping over the fridge and they've got their um, purse and the grocery cart. Why would you leave your purse in your grocery cart anyway? And I would walk and they'd run and grab it. Or you get into an elevator and people walk off. I remember this example I gave you about the probation officer talking about I was a pink belt drug dealer. So a couple of years ago, me and the prosecutor from Taunton, were, we went to lunch. And we came back and we were going through the back door of the Taunton courthouse and a prosecutor from another town says to the, um, the, the prosecutor from Taunton, is this your lunchtime arrest? Oh, boy. No hello, no hi, how, you know, you could at least give me a hug and say that there. <laughs> I would have felt a little better, at least there was some misguided empathy. But that was his comment to, 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 the, to the prosecutor. I, and I'm a calm, cool guy, and I said, well, why would I be under arrest? And he says, I don't know. And I says, well, you know what? If you weren't a cop and I didn't work for the courthouse, I'm like, I can't say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I felt about it. Because he made the assumption because I was, and, and I write it out with this bit funny. Remember this. I'm, just imagine, I'm a trial court employee. Just imagine a young black male or young brown or Asian or male, or, 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 and sometimes it isn't even a race, sometimes it's about class. Just imagine having to encounter that cop. That's the prosecutor. He's the guy that makes recommendations to the court about sentencing or dispositions. But that is not an isolated incident, and I can give you hundreds of examples like that. So unconscious bias is a mental process that stimulates negative attitudes about people who are members of one's own in-group, not one, members of one's own in-group. Implicit racial bias leads to discrimination against people who are not members of one's own racial group. So it's important that you, you, we make a lot of decisions unconsciously. These are just, I can skip this slide. I was doing a presentation and Chief Justice Kerry and Ron Gantz were in the room. Now what better than to include it? <laughs> <laughs> So I left it there because I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> but these were my brown and post slide. You can edit this out, right? <laughs> so Chief Justice Gantz in 2015 was addressing. Um, excuse me, what you get. Oh, excuse me. I go ahead, just speak. About, I didn't know about the editing. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you could say what you're going to say. Just a comment. Make it. Well, I wondered if that gets edited or it's just straight, you know, through whatever you say verbatim. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, at all. Uh, well, I think there are a lot of lawyers soon to be in here, so if I do get sued based on this presentation, I would expect some free representation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Chief Justice Ganson, in, 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 in an address to the bar, says, um, we need to learn the truth behind the trouble and disparity, and he's talking about <coughs> Stevenson in Massachusetts. Once we learn it, we need the courage and the commitment to handle the truth. He's, uh, Chief Justice Paula Carey, who probably for me is one of the most spectacular human beings you'll cross paths with in your lifetime based on her commitment and willingness to tackle the issue of diversity within the trial court and do something about it. And many folks have tried. There have been any number of different reports that have looked at this issue. But she's the one person, along with um, the new court administrator, John, who really said we need to make some changes. But she says, addressing racial and ethnic disparities is one of the top principles that the trial court is working on in the coming year trying to determine the impact of the legal system on disparate populations based on race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And I can tell you that is happening. Well, she's established any number of um, task force. There's a trial court race and implicit bias committee. There's a number um, of other groups that are working across every department to address the issue of diversity and inclusion across the trial court. And, and so this is a great time because, you know, uh, one of the things when I've joined the group 
in, in the mission was, I said, look, we got to rewrite the mission statement. We got to rewrite the vision statement. Because unless it isn't a stated goal and objective of something that we need to fundamentally adhere to and subscribe to, we're going to struggle. So, the, in, 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 so over the next couple of months, the trial court will be unveiling a new um, strategic plan. All right. So unconscious bias does not mean that people are hiding their racial prejudice. I, 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 you know, for, for the most part, you think you're doing something good, right? Sort of like those microaggressions. Anybody, you guys all know microaggressions, right? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you guys have been through that. I don't know how many times I've been told I speak well, like I'm supposed to speak gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, well, you know, they say to me, how many languages do you speak? And I said, just one, man. I'm from Barbados, you know, it's an English colony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know. Well, I, you know, I used to love this one, you know, what part of Africa are you from? Yeah. Oh, no. And then I ran into a guy from Minnesota one time said to me, hey, have you ever had a hamburger? And I'm thinking, no, I have never had a hamburger. <laughs> you know, this is like 1984. I mean, well, what do you think, man? You know. <laughs> I was gonna say no, I just oh, I didn't have chicken, but you know that would have that would have been played too much to that kind. So you know, so you gotta be conscious, and we do this. Look, I mean, and and, and nobody mean you know sometimes it isn't mean to be malicious, and doesn't necessarily subscribe that you wanted the mean folks. Part of it is understanding that you know when when you when you when you're asking people or you're talking to people, just be conscious of the engagement, and not that you need to be on guard all the time. <coughs> not that you need to. But it speaks to the idea in the criminal justice system, unconscious racial bias can negatively influence decisions made by judges. For example, research, we know about this, this is proven theory. Research on capital punishment shows that the killers of white victims are more likely, less, more likely to be sentenced to death than the killers of black victims. And that black defendants are more likely than white defendants to receive the death penalty. Can anybody cite that passage? One of the, this came from uh, Richard R. Banks. He did a um, discrimination and bless and race. Um, and this was back as far back as in 2006. But this data is data that exists long before then. Um, the role of perceptions of people of different race and, and or ethnicity is also influential on criminal justice outcomes. It says an abundance of research find that beliefs about dangerousness and threats to public safety. And we see this a lot of times with young black men. We saw this with the, um, the, the young man that was shot in, uh, what is it, Ohio, Cleveland, Tahir Rice, Price. The young man that was 12 years old, a got, cop got out of the car, right? And he was playing with a tiger. And in two seconds, he made a determination shit that that child should die. Two seconds. From the time he got out of this car, he just got out and he started firing. 12 year old. You saw the, uh, uh, so scholars have found that people of color frequently given harsh um, sanctions because they're perceived as imposing greater threats to public safety and therefore deserving of greater social control and punishment. And there's a there's, there's significant research to show that, um, that, that, that people engaging with young black males especially tend to perceive them as much older than they are. So the judgments that are made quick based on that but level of dangerousness and risk that they present. I mean, this relatively, and, and I've experienced this firsthand. I used to, when I was boxing professional, I remember I used to live in Bridgewater and I would be out on the road, I'd always do road work around 5.30, 6 o'clock. And you know, and this is back in what, 1984, not everybody had an automatic car though. And I used to love this when you come into a light and you know, people stop at the stoplights and you're running early in the morning and still, and people be diving over the other side just to lock the door because you're coming by a stoplight. Like, come on, man, I'm up for a run. I'm not into, I, I don't feel like robbing anybody today. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I always like run and look like, you know, like, like come on, yeah. But, but, but just too many new, too many words to describe. So here's the status, you know, so, so we like to believe that we're so great in this part of the country about justice and, and, and disposition of justice. The uh, court administrator tell this story, uh, or you know, well not the court administrator, but the folks from Alabama just did a tour of Massachusetts, and they were going around looking at some of parts of our system, and they were shocked with the level of disparity at some of our key positions. Shock. So Alabama is saying to us, "Ooh, you guys are not really as diverse as we thought you should be, or would be." You know, this is Alabama. <laughs> Who was the dude that was running for Congress, Senate? Right more, shoot. 
But anyhow, so, so here for every 100,000 individuals in Massachusetts, we send about 241 white males to prison. For Hispanic, we sent about 928. For African Americans, we sent about 1,502. For Native American population, which isn't that large, but we sent a significant number to prison. I mean, that's just scary. But that's just not here in Massachusetts, that's national. So the question is, what accounts for that disparity? Anybody want to say? Do we commit more crime? If I take 500 of you, in this room, regardless of your race or ethnicity or sexual, and put you in a village, but maybe the men will slightly collect more crime. But the crime rate isn't that going to be that statistically significantly different. So how do we explain these sentencing? Policing. Yeah, proactive policing. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. I mean, naturally, these populations live in some of the most highly policed areas in the world. But that in itself don't always explain all of it. A lot of it has to do with attitudes, engagement family histories. Because let me tell you, if you got a brother before you or a sister before you who was terrible, everybody knows. Oh, that's Billy's brother. Billy was a terror. <laughs> well, you're never going to get the benefit of the doubt either. Go ahead. Five minutes? Oh, really? Yeah. All right. They did. All right. <laughs> so, so here, 2014, the statistic says that in our prison population was about 9,486. Blacks represent 6.6% .6 of the population. Yet they represent 28% of individuals incarcerated. Latinos, 10.5% of the population, 26% of those sentenced. It says approximately 13% of drug use. African Americans represent 13% of drug use, 36% of arrests, 46% of incarcerated. How do you explain that? Right? Go ahead. Um, isn't like 95% of the men, though? And I think that, like, Thug, people see men as like thugs. You well, you, you, you're so subscribing to the same reason why we have the discrimination, but go ahead. That's the stereotype. Yeah, well, it is, right. You know, yeah. especially if they're male. Well, well, it isn't just male, but it's an attitude about an entire group and race, a class of people. So, it, 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 um, let me see what I, I do want to get to some fun stuff. So all across, what, so one of the things that I did as a regional supervisor, I recruited 142 individuals that are now located in every courthouse or probation department across the Commonwealth or office that we have. And these folks are trained to um, identify opportunities for interdepartmental and community engagement around diversity. So part of it, we've been, we've engaged in racial and ethnic disparity training. We've in, um, engaged in, um, LGBTQIA trainings across the state. We're developing whole curriculums within all of the courthouses where these individuals can be skilled in having conversations, leading debates and discussions around diversity. All right, so on, um, this is just a training. On September 28th, this last year, we celebrated in every courthouse, in every office, something called Cultural Appreciation Day. And it was so successful that the Chief Justice has now expanded it to Cultural Appreciation Week. And here, this is, um, these are three pr probation employees from the Chelsea District Court, but all of Ecuadorian background, which is beautiful. But then you're seeing pictures, say Boston Municipal Port, you see native Wampanoag um, dancers that were here. We've got a um, McKinsey District Court. This lady was conducting a Mandarin dance or China, a dance. She's from China. Uh, Berkshire County, western part of the state. This is Barnstable District Court. And so you can see some of the celebrations that were happening. And this was occurring in every courthouse on September 28th last year. Anybody recognize anybody? It's just kind of brown, right? Uh, she's over here to the right. Yeah. The Superior. Superior Court. That's where you did your work this last year. Essex County. And you can see this all across. This was especially powerful for me. These were fifth grade kids from the New Bedford, at the New Bedford District Court where they drew flags from some of the countries that they came from in their backgrounds and then they came into the courthouse and they not only displayed the flags but they had conversations with the staff about it. All right, this is just some newspaper links. This is I like. This is when I see you through my eyes, I think that we're different. When I see you through my heart, I know we're the same. Is there anything more beautiful than that? <laughs> there anything more beautiful than that is adopting a cat or a puppy? <laughs> all right, I, so, all right. any questions, comments? I wasn't that convincing, but go ahead. 
But the <coughs> of genders, who plays a significant piece? Well, and ageism, and I mean, all of the isms, quite frankly. It does. So when I, you know, even though this is, yeah, when I think about diversity, I think all of this components. So when I talk about cultural proficiency, you've got to be able to engage regardless of who walks in. So, so again, class, race, sex, just physical ability, age, age yes, you name it. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Come on. I, I, I feel cheated if I leave it on you. I, I said, that's probably a really good question. Okay, well, um, I wish there were more probation officers. I wish there were probation officers, blind probation officers like you. Um, well, well, thank you. Right? I, I think there's the some, is, but. But what I found really interesting was that you describe the probation department as being the business of customer service. Yeah. Right? I mean, I would think a lot of probation officers, uh, probably the majority of them, would say, I'm in the business of public safety. And, and I, I feel like, and, you know, we don't have time to, you know, really maybe to dig into this as much, but I feel like one of the things that, in, in your comments today, I felt like we didn't quite get into is the fact that there's a tension here, right, between the clients as being risk to, to public safety. You know, look, you had a chance, you were on probation, and you tested positive, or you found a gun in your house, and now you're saying it's not yours, we'll let the judge decide. And, that tension that probation officers have to walk with choosing between second chances or jail, that plays into the incarceration rates. Well, it does, but I also think that, I mean, I think within probation, we do so much more than just the public safety. I mean, we're in mediation. I mean, we're, you know, we, we're into treatment. We're into programming. So a significant amount of our opponent, uh, our programs, I mean, we spend a lot of time interacting with families, you know, building support groups and networks. So. You're right. There, there's, a, there's, within, there's this inherent tension between the social service aspects of, of, of probation versus the public safety. But usually we see that as one of those um, things that, you know, when we get to that point, naturally we need to make that decision. But long before we get there, there's significant opportunities to help people to reform their lives, whether it's through treatment program, accountability. There, there's, a, there's a significant amount of components. So, so I don't have a problem with the conversation at all because I think in many ways we still have a lot of probation officers that see it that way and function that way but we have revised you know the assessment instruments that we do that, that we're using we're now much more about um, you know looking at people around treatment issues treatment needs dynamic risks what are the how do we help folks resolve those things that you know decision making skills that in a, that, that may get them to make, uh, uh, force them into bad behavior or, 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 or make bad decisions. We're now looking at helping them assess that, helping them work on some of the issues that, that they identify. Because in the part we would say, here's the menu, you need to follow that. Now we're asking people, what do you want to work on? What are some of the areas you identify as problem areas? And we're building that into supervision plans and treatment plans. We're something, we have, all probationers that have risk needed are under, you know, something called a probation individual change agreement in addition to the conditions of probation. And together they sit with the probation officer and develop that plan on how they're going to be successful in probation. And this is in every courthouse that with any person, either a juvenile or adult, who has risk need supervision or is under the supervision of the court for delinquent or criminal offenses. You know, then you can get into probate court, which is, you know, nothing there is criminal. It's all about mediation and resolution. And, so, so there's a lot of components to probation. And, but you're right, I think we're in the customer service business. Because if we do a good job there, we go, it is go, it's going to make a difference. But we're also good at calling it when we say it. And if somebody presents any level of risk or danger, we are going to make sure they get off the street. So, so you have to do that. Because at the end of the day, nobody's interested in the good feel, touchy stuff. <laughs> and, and so, but we understand the balance. And I think we're much better now as a system understanding that balance. If you guys have more questions, there's a class in here right now. Sorry. One, so just uh, feel free to take your questions outside yeah. to the foyer. I think Harrison's going to stick around for a Thank bit. You. But thanks yeah. everyone for coming. Thank you. There are flyers on the table with uh, short bios for our speakers, and Professor Farber has uh, generously agreed to be our moderator for today. So I'm going to let her take over. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks to the guild and. Um, everybody putting this thing together for this week. Um, it's a great week of panels, and it's great to see so many people turning out for this. So 
thank you all for being here. Um, so I just want to I want to begin this panel uh, really quick by saying that all the folks up here are really agents for change, and they use their law degrees really as swords uh, to to make change happen. Um, and I think that what you're going to hear today uh, from hopefully the four people um, <laughs> is. Um, uh, is really going to be inspiring uh, and give you ways to think about um, law as a as a tool for reform um, from the grassroots the grassroots. Up. I'm proud to say that uh, I served on the National Lawyers Guild uh, Mass Chapter Board of Directors with all these folks. Um, and um, uh, sorry to leave Ben out on this one, but all of us here are Northeastern Law School alums. And so now. Ben. Um, and uh, you know, it's just um, so they're gonna they're gonna tell you um, some of their stories. A few of them. Uh, we're gonna give each panelist about 10, 12 minutes, and I'm gonna be the person cracking the whip on time, just to make sure that if we do have four speakers, everyone gets a, a, a appropriate amount of time. Um, but I'd encourage you. I know folks have class at one, which is why we're gonna kind of try to stay on track. But for those of you who do not. You can have an informal conversation, you can hear more stories, and you can uh, get to know these folks a little bit um, when, the, when the panel's over. So without further ado, uh, you all have their bios, so I'm not going to introduce people. We're just going to kind of keep moving down the, down the line. You know their names, and we're going to start with Jeff Floyd. Hi. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, my name is Jeff Foyer. I'm uh, currently in private practice with my partner Lee Goldstein in a two-person law firm in Cambridge, Mass. Um, I went to law school in the 80s and uh, was not interested in criminal law, unlike my esteemed colleagues here who were uh, really good criminal law practitioners. Uh, but I was interested in using law as an instrument of bringing about social change. I had been a social worker for 15 years before I went to law school, working with uh, delinquent youth and with uh, um, hardcore drug addicts and, and heroin addicts in New York City, um, and then in the delinquent youth in the Boston area. And I went to law school uh, with the idea of uh, adding some um, tools to uh, the toolbox that I had as a social worker um, to not work with just individual cases but to find a way to use the law as a tool to bring about systemic change. Um, <clears throat> fairly early on, starting in law school, and then afterwards I got involved with the National Lawyers Guild, um, which uh, I see as the kind of legal arm of the progressive movement in this country. Uh, not the role as leadership, but as a, an organization that provides legal support to activists, community organizations, community organizers, uh, grassroots organizers, people who are doing things to bring about systemic change in their communities and in their states. So um, in, in order to develop that kind of practice, um, uh, I first went to work for a small law firm that uh, concentrated on representing children who had been lead poisoned. And uh, we, we, uh, I did that for about uh, uh, almost 10 years after graduating law school, um, working with a couple of different firms, representing children uh, who had been lead poisoned, also lobbying in the uh, state house for a change to our lead poisoning laws uh, to provide further protection for people. Um, and one of the things I learned was, uh, I, although I didn't come out of law school since I went, was in the early 80s with the kind of debt that you, you all are facing and the kind of uh, tuition costs that, that you all had, was to find uh, some form of uh, civil practice that would bring in some money um, where I wouldn't have to necessarily charge my clients for that. And that's a, it's a difficult balance to achieve, but there are a number of um, statutes and a number of areas of law where there are fee-shifting statutes that uh, say that if you win a case, then the other side has to pay the fees for that. And one of the big areas, and the area that I'm 
that I now kind of specialize in is the landlord-tenant law. We have very strong landlord-tenant laws in Massachusetts that uh, protect people, and they have a number of fee-shifting statutes. Uh, if the <coughs> landlord violates the security <coughs> deposit law and you win a case, the landlord pays the fees. If there are really bad conditions in an, <coughs> an apartment or a house uh, and the landlord doesn't fix them up and people get injured, the landlord will pay attorney's fees if they lose a case on that. Um, there's also the Consumer Protection Statute, which covers landlord-tenant law. It's Chapter 93A, the Massachusetts Consumer Protection Statute. And <coughs> um, so I, I found that there was an area where I could represent people um, and build a, a practice without having to charge my clients a, a great deal of money. Um, sometimes we also, uh, with my partner Lee now, we have a sliding scale um, based upon people's income so we can take uh, low-cost cases, pro bono cases, and then cases for people who have more money, we can charge them a much higher fee. And we tell them that we have a sliding scale and why we do this. Um, <coughs> So over the course of time, uh, a after representing uh, children who had lead poisoning, I, I went and formed this firm with my partner, Lee Goldstein, who had been practicing longer than I had. Uh, he, he teaches now at uh, Harvard Law School in the uh, Legal Aid Bureau, half-time, and is uh, half-time in our firm. And um, as a two-person law firm, we also found a couple of other uh, civil niches that uh, other people on the left didn't generally practice. So my partner in particular is very good in the area of uh, helping nonprofit organizations and uh, helping to set up tax exempt organizations. So that's another area where we can bring in some fees and, and pay for a civil practice and pay for overhead um, uh, while at the same time doing good. Um, that also allowed me to spend a great deal of time working with the National Lawyers Guild. And I've been an active member of uh, the Mass Defense Committee, which uh, Maki is now the coordinator of, co-coordinator of, with, uh, with uh, Josh Raisler Cohen. Um, and the Mass Defense Committee uh, provides uh, lots of legal support to activists um, by providing legal observers, trained legal observers, training legal observers, and providing them for demonstrations, mass demonstrations, and providing uh, training in uh, direct action um, and on the consequences of civil disobedience, and then providing pro bono representation for people who are arrested at political demonstrations, progressive political demonstrations. Um, and uh, both my partner and I understand that uh, we're not in this in the practice of law to become wealthy to uh, you know become famous to become rich or anything like that we're, we're doing this as part of a social justice movement uh, and see ourselves as adjuncts to the people who are really fighting the activists who are really fighting for progressive social change um, so I do a lot of training of legal observers. I do a lot of representing of people arrested, pro bono representation of people arrested at demonstrations. <coughs> we have a, a big trial coming up in, um, in March with people who are uh, arrested uh, at the, protesting the building of a pipeline in West Roxbury. Uh, and I'm part of a four lawyer team uh, from the National Lawyers Guild who are representing them. And I've represented people who've been arrested during the Justice for Janitors campaign, the, the Democratic National Committee uh, campaign here. The, the MBTA uh, in Boston had uh, a search uh, policy that they instituted. We had people, uh, we represented people who were arrested uh, protesting that. Uh, during Occupy, I was one of the lead attorneys during the Occupy um, uh, movement in Boston representing people who were arrested and also bringing a civil suit against the, uh, the city of Boston. Um, and uh, that's a, a, a major part of my practice, supported by the, the people who are paying for the other services. And the services, I think, are still also part of 
um, being a socially active uh, attorney. So uh, landlord tenant law, we don't represent any landlords at all. We only represent tenants. I, with, I have to say, with one exception, I represent a, uh, uh, a um, nonprofit shelter that, that provides um, uh, housing for uh, homeless uh, uh, women and uh, women and children. And I do represent them as a landlord once in a while when, the, when they have problems. Uh, but other than that, I only represent tenants. We represent employees who are uh, having problems at work, being discriminated against or being uh, harassed or losing their jobs. And we represent only employees. We don't represent employers. And we represent um, consumers being ripped off. And we represent nonprofit organizations, lots of art organizations, and political organizations. Um, and all of these kind of pay the bill for uh, the political work that we're able to do. And it, it took a while to build up that practice, and it took a while to, to figure out how to uh, earn enough money to be able to um, uh, work with, uh, do the political work that I wanted to do. Um, and still be able to make a living. So it wasn't, uh, you know, we easy answer like that to coming out of law school. Um, the first firm that I worked at was uh, also pretty political, but their their goal was uh, was more narrow. They they were doing lead poisoning children and real estate. I had no real interest in doing real estate. Um, even though most people are happy uh, doing real estate because the seller wants to sell and the buyer wants to buy, so people are happy doing that, but uh, it was boring to me. So, um, so uh, it took some time to figure out how, how to do that, um, and my ability to do political uh, work and, and uh, work with the National Lawyers Guild has uh, varied over time, uh, depending upon how busy we were in our private practice. Uh, but there was always the understanding that that was the goal of the practice, was to combine political work with work that would allow us to make a living. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Okay, our next speaker, Ben, go ahead. Okay, my name is Ben Faulkner. Uh, I am in private practice. I have two law partners, uh, Jim Krasnew and Paul Clem, and we have a law firm uh, up in Andover, Mass. Uh, up in the Merrimack Valley um, with a fair amount of our case work in the Lawrence and Lowell area. Um, I would sort of describe my practice as uh, less overtly political, I suppose, uh, than Jeff's and more uh, political in the sense of uh, inherently political. Uh, I do probably Three quarters of my practice is criminal defense, and about a quarter of it is civil practice. Uh, and I like to think that the criminal defense side is the most important of the two, although I suppose in a sense uh, the less overtly political and the more inherently political. Why do I say that? Criminal defense basically amounts to representing people who are targets of the state or the federal government. Uh, and the vast majority of people who are the targets of the state or federal government are people uh, that are poor and people of color and uh, people uh, with precarious immigration situations. Um, so in that, I think just about every criminal defense practitioner is happy to have a few private cases uh, they kind of help keep the lights on, uh, but the vast majority of the work that I do is court appointed. And that means that I represent juveniles in the Lowell Juvenile Court, I represent uh, adults in the district court, I represent um, people charged with crimes in federal court in New Hampshire, and I represent people on appeal. Uh, who have lost their cases and are trying to get back out of jail. Um, all of those people, from the young children uh, through the adults, for the most part, are both terrified and confused about what's happening to them 
what is the state doing to them? What is the federal government doing to them? Um, and even more so than obtaining good results for them, one of the most important things that you can do with your law degree is be able to tell people what's happening to them, why it's happening to them, what's the next thing that's going to happen to them, and what can be done to help them. Um, the vast, again, the vast majority of people don't understand the legal system. The vast majority of people who have been accused of a crime really uh, are, they're showing up to court, they're being told this is the next thing that's going to happen to you, but they really don't understand what's going on. Um, and the personal connections that you make with your clients uh, when it is that you can bring them into your office, you can explain to them everything that's going on in a way that is relatable to them, uh, really in, an, in a system where you have judges that have basically no interaction other than to scold them, you have prosecutors that do nothing but say bad things about them in a courtroom, you have probation officers, some of whom may talk to them in a, in a normal way, but some of them are doing nothing other than saying bad things about them in a courtroom. You're the only person who's talking to them like they're uh, a human being. Um, and it's both the most discouraging work that you can ever possibly do and the most uh, encouraging work uh, that you can ever possibly do, I think, uh, to be able to take someone, particularly a young person, and get them through their case, but also get them through their case in a way that they have uh, hope for the future. Um, so. Uh, ben, do you want to say anything about Watertown, your involvement? I think people might find that kind of interesting. Yeah, so um, I'll come to Watertown. The other side, I, I told you I do um, civil rights work, uh, and that often involves police misconduct cases, and there's a federal statute called 1983. So my law firm does a fair amount of work, um, basically uh, suing the police when somebody <coughs> has been wrongfully arrested or beaten up by the police during the course of an arrest, so excessive force type cases. Uh, and uh, Hillary and I did a lot of work with the National Lawyers Guild in the wake of the, um, uh, the blockade of Watertown. Um, and. Uh, the Lawyers Guild did a, a series of meetings in Watertown, and uh, when I say the blockade of Watertown, I mean in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombings. Uh, and it was, uh, I think the Lawyers Guild probably at that time was the only organization uh, that was saying anything at all about the fact that the police may have done something wrong by taking an entire neighborhood setting up a blockade around the neighborhood and telling everybody you, you can't leave your house. You, if you leave your house, you're going to be held up at gunpoint um, by <coughs> basically uh, what it amounted to, tanks and uh, machine guns um, and police officers dressed as soldiers. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of interaction. We did a lot of uh, panels talking to people in Watertown, uh, both about the legal implications about what had happened to them, but hearing their own stories. Uh, and I think we did probably four or five panels. Um, uh, we did panels at a, at a few law schools, but we also did panels right in Watertown at their public library. Uh, ultimately, uh, we never brought a 1983 case, and that time is now uh, gone, uh, but it was very interesting um, uh, to sort of hear from people about how they felt like prisoners uh, in their own home. So. All, right. All right, so we'll keep moving down the list and then we'll have time for Q&A. Maki, you're up. Hi, I'm Maki Anzalatos. Um, I am, as Jeff said, I coordinate the Mass Defense Committee of the National Lawyers Guild in Massachusetts, along with um, my good friend Josh Raisler-Cohn. 
Um, my job job uh, is that I'm a public defender for the state of Massachusetts. I work at CPCS um, in the Boston Superior Court Office. Uh, and I'm also in their training unit, training new lawyers as they sort of come into the agency. Tell them what CPCS stands uh, for. I would. Um, so CPCS is just the state public defender office. It stands for the Committee for Public Counsel Services, um, as is the way with government bureaucracy. It's a really terrible name that doesn't tell anyone what we actually do. Um, but we're public defenders. Um, so my, my life as a lawyer, I think, like business-wise or sort of like employment-wise, is a little different than, um, than like what you've heard of so far. Because uh, I'm just a state employee. I get a government check. I get benefits. I don't have to worry about keeping the lights on. Someone else does that. Um, and the trade-off of that is uh, you don't make a ton of money, uh, but you don't have to worry about running a business. So for folks that are not interested in or not good at that, like I am, um, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice alternative. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways you can be a, you know, a lawyer for the movement and be a rebel lawyer and be like a resistance lawyer. Um, and none of them are sort of better than others. They're just different. Um, so I think you'll come across people in the movement um, who you know, work for organizations that do sort of big impact litigation, sort of see their skill as a lawyer to be shaping policy either through the courts or through the legislature. Um, and I think that's important. Um, and there's a lot of great organizations around the country that do that. Um, I think there's folks like, you know, you've heard of already on the panel who have small practices and sort of dedicate a lot of their time to movement lawyering in a, in a different sense. So you're not doing um, as much big policy work, but you're supporting sort of small grassroots organizers. Um, that's the work I'm more interested in uh, personally. And I think that the Guild um, is a really sort of vital and sort of instrumental organization to be involved in if you want to be a lawyer that's connected to movements. Uh, and I think it's largely because of what Jeff said, and I want to say it again because I think it's super important, which is that the thing I like about the Guild is that we really have this ethos that, you know, I think for most of us that lawyers are not making change, right? We're actually not very good at making change because the law is this sort of inherently oppressive institution. And so as you make structural changes in the law, the powers that be find ways to still use those laws in an oppressive way. That's how systems work. Um, the people that make change are people that are organizing and people in the streets and activists and community organizers and grassroots organizations. Um, and I think if you, sometimes like when you're in these buildings, we lose sight of this. And so you read about the big case, right? You read about the big civil rights case or the big gender discrimination case or the, you know, big gay marriage case or whatever the case is. And, 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 and nowhere in the case book, at least the case books I have, maybe they've gotten better, do they talk about all the people that organized for like the 30 years before that case that actually made that case possible. Um, and so the reason that I like the Guild is because I feel like I can use my law degree to support the people that are doing all of the work um, that actually really makes social change. Um, and I'll, I want to just talk for a minute specifically about sort of what that looks like. Um, the, because of my role as a state public defender, I, I'm limited, right? I can't represent people um, outside of the confines of my job. I can't go into court and just represent someone. Um, and so for a lot of folks, that may seem like, oh, well, what can you, you know, then what can you do? And you can actually do quite a bit because I think the thing um, to remember is if you are a lawyer, regardless of sort of what tact you're taking to support the movement. If you, if you make a commitment and you say, as a lawyer, my first and foremost responsibility is to be supporting radical and progressive movements, you have this automatic privilege like, and this automatic set of resources that, and this automatic access to a whole world that people don't have just because they're not lawyers. Um, and so you can be, I think, you know, it was described earlier as a, as a sword. You can be a sword for the movement. You can be a shield for the movement. You can be a resource for the movement to teach people things and help people access things so that their leadership is more effective and so that their movements are more effective. And so some examples of the stuff I do, um, so I can talk a little less esoterically, which is probably helpful, um, is, you know, when there's major protests and 35 people get arrested in Boston and there's, you know, people are scrambling trying to figure out what's going on, I can just walk into a police station and say, I want to go talk to them. And they let me in because I have this stupid piece of paper that says I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, and so that's huge, right? Because now I've, I've, you know, one of the things that happens when activists get arrested is they're, you know, they're cut off from their, from their movement, right? And there's, there's communication stops and no one knows what's going on and it's scary. And I can just walk into a police station and say, I want to talk to this person. 
And that can be helpful if we're trying to monitor for like injuries because you know Ben's gonna sue the cops in a few months down the line. It's helpful to just connect organizers and leadership to the folks that in their organizations that have been arrested. Um, it's morale boosting for the people that have been arrested because getting arrested is really scary. So that's like one area where just the function of being a lawyer with really no skill set that is really unique at all allows me to be this really big support network for uh, a movement. Um, there's infinite examples of this. So um, another thing I've done recently that's sort of outside of typical just representing people is um, there's a group of radical sex workers that organize in Boston um, and do sort of labor organizing and policy work and stuff amongst the sex worker community. Uh, and they had a bunch of questions about sort of legal implications to different work they were doing. Um, and I was able to just meet with them, read a bunch of statutes, help them, and this is sort of what Ben was talking about, like help turn it into plain English and help them understand the statute so that they could make sure that what they were doing, um, that they could be as safe as possible in what they were doing. So that was something where it didn't take a lot of my time. It didn't really interfere with my job job because I just you know, had a lunch break, went and met with them for an hour, and set them up so they could be better and more effective at the organizing that they know how to do uh, and that they're good at. Um, I had the real like, good opportunity to be able to go out to Standing Rock um, and help out with the Water Protector Legal Collective out there. And one of the things I spent most of my time in the week I was at Standing Rock doing was negotiating the like return of a bunch of cars that were towed, right? Which doesn't seem like when you think of like movement lawyer and you think of like you know representing the defendants in Attica or like you know these big moments and that stuff is super exciting. But it's also sort of exciting, you know. It's also useful that you know a bunch of mostly indigenous, mostly low income um, folks who were like fighting the real fight and the good fight and getting real hurt for it. Um, one day, the government just came in and towed like 300 cars. And, you know, the implications, that was this crisis moment where, you know, the leadership and the folks that were trying to organize the Standing Rock had a million things to do. And, and you know, that was just another thing piled on their list. And me as a lawyer could sort of call this tow company and call the cops and play like, good white lawyer and just and negotiate this thing and 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 use my a lot of my access and resources and my law degree to sort of help this situation um, and so that was just sort of another random thing Jeff talked about the trainings we do so we do hun I don't know maybe not hundreds but dozens and dozens and dozens of trainings a year um, on a number of issues so we train legal observers to monitor protests for police misconduct we train um, activists and organizers who are planning civil disobediences to know what the law is around doing civil disobedience and, and, and direct action. Um, we train, I, I just did a training a couple days ago for folks that are doing um, uh, accompaniment work with immigrants. So what that means is like going to court or going to immigration appointments with immigrants and um, being an accompaniment and a monitor for potential uh, interactions with ICE met with them, talk to them about some of the legal implications of that and how to stay safe doing that. Um, and so there's a, a million things you can do. And so I think a lot of people come out of law school and like, I have to get a job, I have to make money, I'm not gonna have time to do this. And I, I don't think that's true. I just fundamentally don't think it's true. I think it's hard, maybe, and there's challenges, but I think you can absolutely do it. Um, and you can do it in a lot of different ways. So, um, and I think if you access the guilt particularly, um, you will get, a lot of different examples from different kinds of lawyers about how to do the work um, and how to do it uh, effectively. Um, I did graduate from a time when there was enormous amounts of debt, so um, I know what that's sort of like. Um, and you know, I think there's different ways to manage it, but you know, most of the younger folks, so I graduated law school in 2009, but most of the younger folks I know, um, you know, were just on like income-based repayment and. We're going to be in debt for a long time, and we're never going to be rich, but we're going to be perfectly comfortable. And I think a lot of it is about sort of what you value and what sort of how life, how you want to live life. Um, and none of us are, you know, none of us are struggling in any like fundamental way. We go on vacations, we own cars, we just, you know, we maybe don't live in super fancy suburbs, but we do fine. Um, and so, and the work is like so rewarding that it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, I could talk a lot more, but I want to hear from Alana. So, so 
Well, I just want to chime in before we get to Ilana um, to just say that if some of you are wondering, well, that all sounds really cool. Like, how do I tap into that, you know, as a law student or as a grad where I might have this day job, but I can also do some of this, some of this pro bono work, some of this extracurricular work on top of my job. Um, and the way that I think, uh, you know, what you should know is that the Guild has a director. Uh, she's actually here in the audience. That's Ursula Matos, uh, oh, sorry, Mazni Latos. These are again um, up there. And, and, and basically, you know, what happens pretty much is that um, Ursula puts out, you, you get involved with the Guild, you get on the listserv, you, you become a member, and all the time Ursula is fielding calls and emails from activists who need a legal observer, who need a legal training, who need this, that, and the other thing, and she basically puts it out to the lawyers, um, you know, and, and, and members of the guild. Um, and by and large, uh, the people up here on this panel um, respond and go ahead and do these things at 8 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock in the morning or far away places and whatever. And, um, you know, they, people just sort of answer the call and do this stuff. And so if that's something that you're interested in getting involved in, then what you do is you join the guild, you get involved, and you go, well, I want to go to one of those, but I want to go with Maki, I want to see him do one of them, I want to go with Jeff, I want to go to some of these trainings and get familiar with how to do this, and then you build expertise, and then you will find yourself going out and, and doing this kind of thing. So that's sort of, that is a, a, a route in, it's very accessible. Um, and, uh, you know, to the extent that you, it really gets you excited, then um, it can set a new course for you in terms of or how you're using the water grid. Uh, Alana Greenstein is here, and um, take it away. You have about 12 minutes to talk about. I'm going to speed talk my way through immigration law. Are you all ready? <laughs> Tiny little subject, not much is happening. So. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm really like, sorry to be walking in late. I I always joke that I went to law school so I wouldn't have to do math, but I also went to law school because like, my sense of direction is terrible. Um, and my job has failed me. Um, so I don't even really know where to start. I, I guess I should, since you're all in law school, um, start by saying that I sort of did law school backwards. Everyone tells you, like, you go into law school and you're not supposed to know what you want to do when you graduate. And you need to go in, tabula rasa, clean slate, let it all flow over you. And then when you graduate, you will have this feeling of what it is that you, you want to go out and do with your law degree. I did it completely backwards. The only reason I went to law school was that I was interested in immigration, um, which made law school very painful, because there was one immigration law class. Yeah. But um, what really kept me going through law school was the Guild. I met Rochelle, I think, my first year there. Um, and it was really a wonderful community um, and a way to kind of stay involved in the reasons why I wanted to go to law school. Not just immigration, but just sort of this more um, broad-based concept that we're all here to do something real and concrete and to um, make a difference to ourselves and the world, which I think is sort of easy to lose sight of as you're sitting there studying con law and you know, getting wrapped up in your own head. Um, so I went to Northeastern, which has this program where you alternate quarters of work and school. Um, and so I was able to do some immigration stuff during law school, which was great. Um, and I, you know, graduated law school, got a job at my first call of employer, which was a small firm um, that did mostly deportation defense um, and asylum and some family-based immigration. Um, and that was where I planted myself for 17 years. Um, I represented people mostly in immigration court um, on appeal up through the federal courts. Immigration is purely federal, so it's got nothing to do with state law at all. Um, a lot of asylum cases. Um, and then switched gears a few years ago and went to work with my husband. Oh, I'm not in law school, so you should all go and marry people in law school. Um, uh, who had his own a solo practice in East Boston doing some criminal defense and immigration. Um, and so that was what I did for almost 20 years. Um, we had a lot of kids on our caseload. There's a special immigration provision for kids who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of their parents. It's a way to get them a green card. 
Um, so we did a ton of those. Uh, we did a lot of asylum cases, um, some family-based cases. Um, and so that all went along. And I have to say, you know, first of all, as far as government agencies with acronyms that actually are meaningful, ICE is like right up there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who named it, but it was a fact. <coughs> Immigration and Customs Enforcement. <coughs> Not from the people. Um, no, I can't remember what I was going to say. So, 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 so immigration is one of these areas that, you know, large parts of the Constitution don't apply to immigrants. Because if you, like, go through and read the Constitution, there's some of the amendments that say citizens. Okay? So the courts have interpreted that as those provisions just don't apply to anyone who's not a U.S. citizen. Um, and immigration <coughs> court, which is where you, I mean, it's called deportation proceedings. Now they call it removal proceedings, as if that's supposed to make it like nice and friendly and they give you flowers there. Um, but it's deportation proceedings. Immigration court is where the government sends you when they're trying to deport you. Um, and the rules of evidence don't apply in immigration court, which was great, because in addition to not being able to do math, I almost failed evidence. <laughs> but parts of the Constitution don't apply. The rules of evidence don't apply. The cards are stacked completely against you. I mean, it is, of all areas of law, I can't think of one in which whatever analogy you want to use, I mean, the visual, I guess, would be David and Goliath, but the cards are stacked so firmly against the non-citizen, which, in a way, is overwhelming and Depressing is the wrong word. It's hard. I mean, it's a very, very, very difficult area of law in which to practice. Um, and the Immigration and Nationality Act, which is the statute that governs immigration, is incredibly complicated and esoteric and convoluted. There's this great Seventh Circuit case, which everybody quotes, in which I think it was Judge Posner um, said something about you know the Immigration Act being second only to the tax code in its complexity. Um, Constitution doesn't apply parts of it. Um, and there's no right to counsel. There's no right to appointed counsel. Um, and there are huge numbers of people going through deportation proceedings with no access to a lawyer. Um, so, all this to say, a few months ago, about six months ago, I completely shifted gears, um, left private practice, um, and went to work for, uh, has anyone heard of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA? It's a bar association of immigration lawyers. It's the one national bar association. And its sister organization, which is its 501c3 nonprofit, they do impact litigation and uh, lobbying, things like that. It's American Immigration Council. So AILA and the council, um, a year ago, anybody remember what happened about a year ago, January 20th? <laughs> right. So about a year ago, um, a new administration came in, and within a matter of days, um, lodged a full-scale attack on immigrants and the immigration system. And there's no other word for it at all. It's a race-based attack on people who weren't born in this country. Um, and it has had absolutely horrific consequences for huge numbers of people. And I won't bore you with the details about that. You all watch television, and you've got a detention center right here down the road. Not a detention center, a jail where there's a lot of immigration detainees. Uh, but the administration started detaining, um, throwing people off into these very remote detention centers in uh, southwest Georgia, two and a half hours from the largest metropolitan area stepped up deportation of uh, women and children crossing the southern border, um, and really has done pretty much everything it could to minimize the few rights that people have in removal proceedings, um, and to use the immigration laws to hurt people. Um, so Ayla, and, 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 and so the bright, sunshiny part of all this is that all these lawyers, all these lawyers, who didn't know anything about immigration, but you know, watched TV, said, dear God, this sucks, this is terrible, they shouldn't be doing that, what can we do? We have law degrees, right? Law degrees are fabulous. <laughs> they really are. I mean, the things that you can do with a law degree is like, wonderful. 
Um, and there was this outpouring of people who wanted to help. So Emma and the council, they got together and like, what are we gonna do? This is awesome, we need to like harness this energy and, and how can we use these people? Because trying to train someone to do immigration law, especially like deportation defense, it's, 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 it's impossible. I mean, like trying to train someone who doesn't know immigration law to just jump in and represent someone in immigration court is really hard. So they said, we're gonna start up a program, and we're gonna figure out a way to do this, and we're gonna use ALA members who know immigration law and the experts to, to, to mentor them, and we're gonna get training materials, and they came up with these very innovative ways of you know, grouping people, and, that, and um, applied for grants, and they got massive amounts of money. I mean, these funders, right? And started up this program called the Immigration Justice Campaign. Um, and the ultimate goal of the justice campaign is to increase and step up representation of immigrant detainees. And that's really it. 14% of immigrants in detention have a lawyer. 14%. And someone who goes through immigration proceedings, immigration court proceedings without a lawyer, wins his or her case about 2% of the time. That means 98% of people in detention, lose. And the chances of winning with a lawyer, I actually forgot that statistic, but it's exponentially higher. It's something up around 30%, maybe 40%. Um, so I left private practice and I left representing individuals, which is very strange. Um, and I went to work for ALA and the council on this program. Um, so I work remotely. I work sometimes from my old office in East Boston, sometimes from home, go down to DC uh, periodically. Um, and it's, it's really kind of wonderful. Um, and I have to say that was a great segue because if anybody's interested in volunteer opportunities um, and is interested in immigration, we definitely have them. We can use people who aren't lawyers, we can use people who are lawyers, interpreters. Um, I think, well, I'm running out of time here, but one of the most extraordinary ways to volunteer, uh, if you can swing it, is to take a week and go down to one of these detention centers. Um, and they have lawyers that work down there and they have on the ground programs. So you go down for a full week um, and help the people who are there representing them day in and day out as their full time jobs. So. Oh, excellent. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, let's let's open it up and see what people want to ask about, and um, and then we'll we'll kind of kind of swing back around to other sort of themes that you guys picked up on. But I want to make sure that people who have questions or comments get a chance to uh, speak to the panel members. So, yeah. Um, Mark kind of addressed this a little bit. I wonder. I wonder where or if you guys have ever experienced like conflicts of interest and how you address that <coughs> in terms of just like spilling over from your private practice into term into like what you do with the guild or vice versa and how you guys have ever addressed that. Um, it might come up well the, I mean I'm, I'm thinking Maki it might come up for you a bit, um, but maybe you know, do you have a you know, response or anybody you want to jump in? I mean I think that there's a question he was asking about like whether conflicts of interest come up a lot between what our you know our movement work and in my context my job job. Um, I mean yes and no. I, I guess there's sort of there's I guess there's two questions there. One is sort of this technical legal conflict of interest, which I think is the less interesting question and the easier answer. Um, <coughs> like yeah, I've met people doing movement work who. You know, our off, you know, my office represented someone, you know, where they were a victim or whatever, and the answer is I just can't represent them, right? And I, someone else can that doesn't have a conflict, and it's sort of, that's, you know, we have a whole system for sort of checking that. Um, so it's not that difficult, right? You just sort of follow the rules. Um, I think there's this more interesting question of like, uh, of, of political and like ethical conflict with, you know, we can sit up here all day and say we support the you know we support the movement we support progressive causes but sort of what does that mean right um, and you know I think we as an organization meaning the guild but also we as individual lawyers you know meaning myself have to decide like who do I consider on my side like who because I'm not 
representing everyone. And so, for example, there was a bunch of um, there was a bunch of people arrested at a anti-white supremacy protest uh, on August 19th, um, and mostly uh, the anti-fascist side was arrested, but some of the um, far right people were arrested. Um, and you, you know, it wasn't a question in my mind like we don't represent them. That's not what we do. That's not our point. Um, there was some pushback from more like, for lack of a better word, like centrist criminal folks that I knew in my world who were like, well, how can you decide that that person doesn't get representation and this person does? And, and the answer to me is easy because that's not what we do, right? And, and I'm not saying that, you know, if they want to start their own National Lawyers Guild for them, they can do that, right? But so it wasn't really, um, but you are, you know, you have to make some of those kind of ethical decisions. And I think um, they have to be informed by, um, the other folks that you're working with, I think they have to be informed by the movement. So just one really quick story and then I'll shut up. I know I've been done for a while. Um, there was, I'm not gonna like name names or whatever, cause, but there was a, basically like a, a political theater action that had an element to it that seemed, in my opinion, a little questionable um, and, and had some like race implications that I wasn't cool with. Um, and so we reached out to like folks in uh, the community that we knew and, and, and sort of had them speak with the folks that were organizing this event, and they actually had this super productive conversation, and they decided to kind of, they recognized the problem, and they sort of dealt with it, and it was actually very productive, and so it was an interesting place where my access as an attorney also was able to like foster this really healthy communication, um, and, but again, like I had to tap into other people in the guild and say like, how do we feel about this? Are we gonna like say something? Are we not gonna say something? And you know, you just do the best you can. Yeah, sure, one, one quick thing to do. So in civil practice, you know, the, the, the myth is that everybody deserves an attorney and when you're in civil practice, you have to represent whoever walks in the door and that's just a myth. That's just not true. We don't represent landlords. So we don't have a, a my, my civil practice is, is uh, politically informed <coughs> and coordinated with my political beliefs and the work I do for the guild. Um, the, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in Boston has a bunch of lawyers from big firms and when they're taking cases um, uh, they have meetings where they decide whether to take a case and every time they have a discussion several of the lawyers there have to leave the room because they represent landlords or the bank that's going to be sued for discrimination or the big employer that's going to be sued so they have to leave the room. That doesn't happen in, in our firm. We know who we're representing. Uh, so you can make those choices. You do not have to take every case that walks in the door. You can decide who you want to represent. Question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Faulkner. Yeah. Is part of what you do to help uh, incarcerated uh, individuals to represent themselves? Or do you know of any organizations who, who specialize in that type of thing? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure if you mean incarcerated people representing themselves in terms of uh, their sentence or in terms of uh, what's happening to them while they're incarcerated? While they're incarcerated. So for instance, mistreatment by right. guards and stuff like that. Uh, I don't personally do a lot of that work. Um, Bonnie Teller, the Prisoner of Legal Services uh, does do that work, Bonnie Teller, Tenor, Tenorello, who is uh, on the board of the Mass uh, National Lawyers Guild, uh, does a lot of that. Uh, so Prisoners Legal Services is sort of the place to go for that. Thank you. I'll also just say real quick that a, a big chunk of the guild membership here in Massachusetts and nationally is made up of, um, of incarcerated people. Um, and so there are jailhouse lawyer memberships to the guild. Um, and there are, um, like within that universe, both through the Guild and then also through um, Prison Legal News, which is an entity in Vermont, I think. Um, there are a fair amount of uh, pro se uh, resources for incarcerated people. So if it's, I could sort of connect you to those places afterwards if, you, if it's something that you wanted. And, and just, just one other point, uh, because it's not specifically what you're asked, but I think it's important for people out there to know, is that if there are prisoners out there who feel that their sentence was somehow unjust, they're entitled to be appointed a lawyer at the very least for the purposes of looking at the case to see 
if that if their underlying case can be undone and all they have to do is write to the committee for public counsel services and say I want someone to screen my case other questions um, yeah Marty just a comment um, as some of them worked in the community and works with a lot of lawyers um, 90 percent of people will just plug away at a local practice and what I found in my 30 going on 40 years, uh, 35 going on 40 years of practice, is that if you don't allow yourself to get into that rut and just plug away, pay the bills, you're a professional and you're just a, a, a journeyman out there. And if instead you do that, because you have to pay the bills and keep the lights on, but you join selectively certain organizations that is huge, and let me give you an example. We have, as you would reference, an ICE unit up the street, right up there. And we have a person in charge of the ICE unit up there who, from a constitutional point of view and an immigration issues point of view, is, you know, with Joe Pyle, whatever the hell his name is, the guy in Arizona who likes to make underwear on prisoners. Um, and there's a whole group that is working on that. And the group, first of all, you belong to an organization. Secondly, you're kept in touch through that organization because there's networking, so there's newsletters. There's a schedule of things that are happening, other organizations, well, that's kind of a cool speaker. There's speakers, there's teach-ins, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when we do all that tap dancing, meet with the AG, have meetings, and try to figure out what to do, and how to advocate, and how to march, and all that stuff, at the end of the day, it's the people who can actually litigate and sue that gets the attention, that forces them to respond, forces them to be found accountable in some cases, especially at the street, and uh, then when they appeal, again found accountable, and that ultimately translates. So uh, my point being is we'll all be plugging away in the trenches, but be sure to remember to do God's work um, because it will keep you sane, it will keep your life relevant, and then when the shit hits the pan like it is now this whole year, you'll feel like you have a, a, a tool chest of sorts. You have a place that you can go with your energy, your concern, your frustrations, or whatever. So thank you to all of you for doing that as a major part of your life. But it's important to those of us who are just sort of rank and file practitioners as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a really good point. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the time, and I'm wondering if I don't wrap up right now. If this entire audience needs to do the class. So why, why don't we thank the panel, and um, we can have a short conversation. I invite anybody who can stick around to talk to these folks. They drove a long way, and they they love to to chat with other people. So thank you for having me down here. Uh, I'm a proud UMass Amherst grad. Um, and that's the reason that I'm here, is that um, I have a connection to this university. Another reason I'm here is uh, Jesse would not stop bothering me. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't say this to um, make comparisons, but um, another reason that I'm here is that when uh, I decided to go to law school, Suffolk, Suffolk was sort of like where UMass uh, law is now in terms of like ranking what people thought of it and sort of like recognition of it wherever um, it does not matter in fact I would rather be here than at any Ivy League or BC or BU because I've met those people coming out of those law schools and they immediately become robots that I want nothing to do with <laughs> um, people who come to law school Law schools like this, law schools like Suffolk back in the day, like New England Law, are people who have other things going on in life than um, just their parents funneling money to their education so they can go make a million dollars. People who go to law schools like this are here because they want to make a difference, and those are the people I want to talk to. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. Um, second is sort of what we were just reflecting on. Um, and as a community, we need to start talking about these things more, not just when it happens. Um, on the one hand, school shootings are terrible and it makes us talk about guns a lot. Um, 17 to 20 black kids are dying every day in neighborhoods. 
uh, around this country. And um, it's, it offends me to hear when people, I, I was at this awful conference and this uh, person, this woman from JP Morgan, this really high up was talking about gun violence and how she never thought about it until Sandy Hook. Um, and I understand that because you need to have some like concept of that could, it could happen to you, but um, this, is, this is something that needs to be daily conversation, not just flash in the pan when something big and bad happens in a school. Um, we need to have a broader conversation about who we are as Americans, what the Constitution means, uh, and balancing the constitutional interests of people with the lives of thousands of other people. Um, so that's it. Um, uh, when I look around this room, uh, I'm happy to see uh, some diversity, because usually when I go to law schools, there is none. Um, even in this room, though, there are two African-American males, three African-American males, one African-American female. Um, and as a public interest law school, we need to be asking ourselves a question about are we representative of the population that we're ultimately going to go and serve. Um, we really need to be asking ourselves that question. And it's not just in law schools that there is a paucity of black lives. There, uh, it, any airplane that you go on, any boardroom that you go into, any classroom in higher ed, there's a paucity of black, brown, queer, native, immigrant faces in those places because of structures that we have in this country since the beginning. And we have to have a real conversation about that. How that started, where it ends, and what role we're gonna play in ending it. 50 years ago, people who looked like me lived in terror. I don't mean the kind of terror that we ascribe to being afraid, being scared to walk around. I mean, the kind of terror that we ascribe to other countries like Syria and Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, Somalia. And over the course of this month on my social media, I've been just posting <coughs> images of the treatment of people of color through this country since its inception. And so I've, I've seen these images of just 50 years ago, photographs of our treatment of people of color in this country 50 years ago. And in diving in, I also have just seen the treatment of poor people in this country since its inception, no matter what color they are. If you're poor and you're different than the establishment, then we use you to get higher up. And when I see these images, I think about the four little girls who went into a church and never came out because somebody threw a pipe bomb down there and nothing happened for decades. I see images of young men who look like me hanging from trees 50 years ago. Hanging from trees with people standing around watching them burn. I see images of a 15 year old boy who was accused of yelling, uh, whistling at a white woman. And he was so beaten beyond recognition for that daring act that his mother had the wherewithal to keep his casket open at his funeral so that the entire nation could see what they had done to him. I think about jails filled to the brim with children in Birmingham, Alabama, until they stopped arresting people because they had nowhere else to put them, just because they wanted to march. And while I think about the instant images, the four little girls and Emmett Till and the boys hanging from the trees and the children in the, in the police cars, and in the jails, I also think about all of the people standing around in the periphery. And I think to myself, looking at them, how could you have let that happen? I never would have let that happen. I would have done something to have stopped that. How repugnant for people to stand around watching that. I would have done something. But then when I sit in first class and I don't see a black person or a brown person, get on the plane unless they're working there and I'm sipping on my cocktails, I don't say anything. When I'm sitting in a boardroom and I'm surrounded by middle-aged white men who are talking about solving problems 
in urban America, I don't say anything. When I'm talking to a classroom of prospective prosecutors at Harvard University and there's one African American female in the entire room, I'm not saying anything. So I have to think to myself, am I doing exactly what those other people are doing in the room, in those photographs, standing around the periphery? Because right now, there are 2.3 million people in jail and prison in this country. We dominate the world in that statistic. The next closest is just over half of that amount is China. And they have lots and lots more people in their country than we do. Despite the fact that we only make up 5% of the world's population, we make up 25% of its incarcerated population. 100% of the children under the age of 18 incarcerated on this planet are incarcerated in this country. 90% of the women who are incarcerated on this planet are incarcerated in this country. 75% of them, when they are incarcerated, are mothers. And because of that incarceration and our failure to address the issues that put them in there in the first place, 50% of them will lose total and permanent custodial rights of their children. And when you start doing that, you start destroying communities. And you don't have to look very far to see what happens when poverty and crime destroys families. Despite the fact that people who look like me only make up 11% of this, this nation's population, we make up almost 65% of the correctional population. That's jail, prison, probation, and parole. And unless you are of the belief that somehow when I was born, there was something in me that made me 65% more likely to offend than any of the rest of you, then I would suggest that maybe law school is not the place for you. 70 million Americans have criminal records. 650,000 people come out of jails and prisons every year to 50,000 collateral consequences that will keep them from successfully re-entering into our society so that 70% of people who are released re-enter within three years. At a cost to us just of having the structures, just of having the buildings of $80 billion a year, Forget about all the societal costs that we pay for welfare, for public housing, our taxes are different, our education systems are different. All of these things I'm telling you because it impacts all of us, regardless of how close or far you ever have been from the incarcerated system. And in fact, after this talk, I never want you to look at an empty chair again because it could be filled with someone that you've never met who's now sitting in jail or prison who might have the next best idea, the next best recipe, the next best song, the next best business plan, the next best cure, the next best relationship, the next best idea. We're missing out. Mass incarceration is screwing all of us. And this isn't just a criminal justice issue. This is a health and equity issue. Because of intergenerational poverty, since the time of slavery, because of this mass incarceration that destroys family, black women in this country find themselves at the bottom of every health metric you can possibly think of. The leading cause of death for a black men between the ages of 18 and 40 years old is homicide. That is not true of any other cohort, of any other people, in any other country, in any other place in this planet. In fact, it causes so much death, it accounts for more death than the next nine leading causes of death of black men ages 18 to 40. That is a public health problem, that is not a criminal justice problem. There are more segregated schools in this country today than there were on the eve of Brown versus Board of Education. There was more representation of Congress, of people of color, in the period of Reconstruction, immediately following the Civil War, than there is now. There are more people of color under correctional control today than there were slaves on the eve of the Civil War. This is a civil rights crisis. We need a new civil rights movement. We've been saying it since the last civil rights movement. 
but it doesn't come. <coughs> and we wait and we wait and we wait and it doesn't come. A lot of the inertia has been blamed on a lack of leadership or waiting for the next Mal Malcolm or Martin or Rosa or someone or anyone to take us to the promised land. But every day that we wait, millions more of us are arrested. Thousands, thousands more of us are incarcerated. Thousands more of us die. So I can't wait anymore. The good news is, when I look into this room, and I see all of you people, I don't see law students. I see all of the new civil rights leaders of our time. When I was 19 years old, I remember standing across from a police officer, handing him thousands and thousands of dollars of cash that I had water watered off over the course of that summer. I remember handing him the little scraps of weed that I had left over from the pounds that I was trafficking between Philadelphia and Boston. I remember looking at him and him looking at me and me registering the look on his face of one of contempt and disgust and frustration that I had become a statistic. And I remember looking back at him as a 19-year-old black man just caught drug trafficking by a police officer and thinking to myself, man, I'm in trouble. But despite the fact that I was a 19-year-old black man standing in front of a police officer in America just having been caught drug trafficking, this is what trouble looked like to me. My mom and my dad are going to be really mad. They might take my cell phone away. I was using my truck to deliver drugs, and they might take that away. And I remember the other dude who got caught on campus selling drugs, and he had to move all the way across campus. That was trouble to me. Despite the fact that if you would just pick me up from where I was and put me into another zip code, here's what trouble looked like for me and thousands and thousands of other young men and women who the war on drugs disappeared. What I had done was a federal offense. What I'd done was a state offense that carried with it a 10-year minimum mandatory sentence. Because of that 10-year minimum mandatory sentence, the likelihood I pled out to that case was about 100%. In pleading out to a drug felony, I would have been a convicted drug felon. And when that happens, I've now deprived myself of access to the things that actually keep us safe. Education, couldn't pay for it would get kicked out. Employment, forget about it. Healthcare, lots of places you cannot get healthcare if you are a convicted felon. The access to transportation, driver's license, gone. The access to pro-social activity, you can't participate in these things because you're a felon. The things that actually keep us safe I would have deprived myself of and therefore the likelihood that I commit another crime to survive went up, not down. And each time I commit a crime, the likelihood I would com commit another one more quickly went up, not down. And each day that I spent behind bars, the likelihood that my mind was going somewhere else than being a productive citizen went up, not down. The likelihood that I would victimize another person went up, not down. And finally, the likelihood that I would commit a serious enough crime to land me in prison for double-digit years went up, not down. All at a cost to you, and unless I stay in there forever, when I come out, I'm a mess in your community. Maybe not your community, but the communities of people who have been putting up with this shit forever. I didn't realize how close I was to my life being over in that moment. I didn't know how close I was to that police officer pushing me over if he wanted to, and me falling down a rabbit hole that thousands and thousands and thousands of young people fall down every year disappearing to the bottom of that rabbit hole and never getting to sit in one of these seats. But he didn't, and I'm here. In fact, I got to go back to college. I graduated from college and went out into the workforce. I worked for three years and then went to law school. Went to law school for three years, came out and joined one of the most prestigious DA's offices in the country. I had a crazy nine-year career, super decorated, highly fulfilling, in fact, it was, I was so decorated that John Legend reached out to me and said, do you want to do a TED Talk? I said, hell yeah, John Legend. I would love to do a TED Talk. <laughs> I did a TED Talk. It blew up on the internet. For the last two years, I've been traveling around the world in this country with every celebrity and artist and activist and athlete you can possibly think of talking about criminal justice reform. Last September, I got to sit across from the 44th President of the United States and tell him what I thought about his criminal justice policy. A month ago, Oprah Winfrey told me she was happy to meet me finally. 
Oprah. <laughs> and then about two weeks ago, my young people let me know that I had a rap lyric and a children's book written about me in the UK. All of that. Not because I was special, not because I was smarter than anyone, not because I was more talented or motivated or creative, none of that. It's because I won the lottery. All of us won the opportunity lottery. Sitting in this room is testament, no matter how hard it took you to get here, that we won the opportunity lottery. My opportunity lottery, the police officer pulled me over, pulled me over in my driveway. The police officer pulled me over was a white man. The police officer pulled me over was my dad. And after he took me down the station and sat me in a cell for a little while and he took me home, he loved me. And that was it. It started when I was born in a foreign country, a shithole, if you will. <laughs> When I was three years old, some lovely working class white people came down and adopted me. I grew up in a white working class town with white working class friends, went to white working class schools, and that privilege that surrounded me saved me in that moment. What I did not understand, and I don't think he understood either, was that my father was handing me a shield and a sword at that time. A shield was the privilege. Protect yourself, protect others with this thing this privilege, this power, this opportunity. Choose what you do with it. You can go to Harvard and you can go make a billion dollars and buy yourself a house in the vineyard. Or you can use it for what it was intended for, sharing it with other people, protecting other people. And your sword was to fight off the haters. Because believe it or not, not everyone agrees with me. And there are people who think that the criminal justice system is functioning just the way that it should. They think that we are safe here because the police are out there stopping the bad guys before they get here. And I didn't know it until I became a prosecutor, that I had this thing in my pocket. What I want to encourage you to do is after this talk, wherever you are, reach out in your pocket and you'll find one too. The question is, how do you use it? Here's how I use mine. When he was 15 years old, I met Stanley for the first time when he came into the Boston Juvenile Court. He had stolen a cell phone. This was back in 2011. And back at that time, um, stealing cell phones was like the crime du jour for juveniles in Boston. In fact, we had a name for it. We called it apple picking. And <laughs> it wasn't because these young people were bad or evil. It wasn't because there was some international cell phone stealing ring. It wasn't because there was some weird gang that chose just to steal iPhones. It was because the folks at Apple thought it would be a good idea to put vestibules in the malls uh, around our city that instead of sending your iPhone back to the, stage, back to the shop and waiting for your get your rebate back, you just put it in there and you get $60 out of the vestibule. Which immediately created an economy for young people because our young people don't have an eco economy to participate in. Remember when we were young and you're just 14, 15 years old, you go get your first job and it's cool and you learn how to work that way and you work your way up. And maybe you cut some grass, maybe babysit. Uh, those jobs don't exist where mass incarceration has destroyed communities. In fact, two weeks ago, when the snow started piling up, my young men were calling me for money. I told them, go get a shovel. Go outside, shovel some cars out. You make $100 in two hours. Their response to me was, you want me to stand out in the street and just be a target? Because the reality in their mind is that lots of kids get killed if they're in one place for too long and somebody sees them that shouldn't see them. So Stanley was stealing his cell phone. I thought I was this woke ass prosecutor, so I was like, come on, Stanley. Don't do drugs, stay in school. Get out of here. I wasn't listening to Stanley. So then when he came back in a few months later, this time he had stolen a Vespa. You guys know what Vespas are? 
with the gentrifiers of Boston came their gentrifier starter pack. <laughs> Wine and cheese store. French bulldogs named after authors. <laughs> Vespers. And our young people learned very quickly that they never told the gentrifiers at the, at the uh, Vespa store, these are really easy to hotwire. <laughs> And so our kids were stealing Vespas and selling them again for $100, $200, not because they were bad or they were evil, but because it was an economy they could participate in. They weren't buying drugs to flip and sell more drugs. They weren't buying guns. They were buying weed and pizza and sneakers. So again, I was like, come on, Stanley. Don't do drugs. Don't stay in school. I mean, stay in school. <laughs> don't, fuck, don't steal Vespas. Get out of here. I wasn't listening to what Stanley was trying to tell me. And in fact, I feel a lot of us fail because we don't listen to the impact of parties. I was taught criminal law by a person who had never been arrested before. It's bizarre. So when he came back into my courtroom when he was 17 years old, this time not through the front door but through the back door in an orange jumpsuit, ankle shackles, handcuffs, and a waist chain, I started listening. Over the course of that weekend, Stanley had gone onto Craigslist and posed as a person who was interested in purchasing uh, motorcycles. And this young man convinced uh, two men at two different times to drive up from Taunton and Middleborough to come to D Dorchester, pick up Stanley and his friend, and then drive out to the back of Franklin Park Golf Course to test drive the motorcycles. When the men took the motorcycles off their pickup truck, Stanley's friend would lift up his, the front of his shirt, revealing what appeared to be a gun, suggested that the men get in their trucks and leave, and then Stanley would take those motorcycles and sell them. Stanley was charged with two counts of possession of a firearm, two counts of armed robbery, two counts of assault with a dangerous weapon. One of those charges alone was a life sentence. All six of them, Stanley is never coming out. So there I was with Stanley and this massive weapon in my hand about what to do with Stanley's life because I knew if I arraigned him on the charges, he would have a criminal record. If I tried him as an adult, he would go to state prison. If he went to state prison, well, he was a 17-year-old boy. And so finally I started listening. And so the first thing I want to do is ask Stanley what happened. For those of you who are defense people, who are cringing about the idea of a prosecutor talking to a person accused of a crime, don't worry. Stanley was 17 and real bad at this setup. He used his own email, stanleyvargas98 at gmail.com, <laughs> to purchase the motorcycle order to, to communicate on Craigslist. Not only that, but Stanley also, after he was, while he was riding the motorcycles to the chop shop, Stanley would take pictures of himself and post it on Facebook. So there wasn't a lot of <coughs> litigation going on. <laughs> Not a lot of discovery to be traded around. So he said, Stanley, what on earth? What on earth? And in that moment, Stanley didn't tell me about the gang that he was trying to jump into or jump out of. He wasn't trying to tell me about the friends he was trying to impress. He didn't tell me about his need for money so he could flip it to get drugs so he could chase paper. All that. He didn't tell me about any of that. Stanley told me about when his family emigrated from the Dominican Republic when he was nine years old. Now, even at nine years old, he appreciated the sacrifice that his parents made in the Dominican Republic to move he and his family to Boston for a better education for Stanley and his two older brothers. He also recognized at nine years old that despite the fact that he was from a developing nation, he moved to a place where he saw more violence and poverty and trauma than he ever had before. And what he was not prepared for was, despite the fact that his family was very insular and stayed away from it all, how quickly it got their clutches on his family. He talked about recognizing that his oldest brother started getting phone calls late at night. Started staying out past his curfew and then all night. 
started showing up with really, really nice clothes and nice things and bundles of money and how he wanted that. Until the federal government came, kicked in their door and took Stanley's brother and sent him to federal prison for drug trafficking. Stanley recalled as his next oldest brother began to act differently too. Suddenly roughhousing became painful for Stanley. Stanley recognized that his brother might have something wrong with him, but that their family didn't have adequate health care to get it checked out. And then Stanley's brother started not coming home, started hanging out with all these new people, started smoking a lot of weed, started bringing it into the house until Stanley's brother was involved in a gang crime, arrested and sent to state prison. Stanley recalls as a teenager how that violence and that poverty and that crime continued to seep through the cracks in their house until all of the stress finally broke the family apart and Stanley's father left. And then Stanley told me about that day that he came home and he found his mother laying on the ground, crying and throwing up, not because she was sad or not because she was sick, but because she was so exhausted from trying to keep it all together. And Stanley told me about the feeling that he had when he put $10,000 on his mother's table. The feeling that that brought a 17 year old boy to see his mother have momentary comfort when he put that money on the table and said, we're gonna be all right. That's what he told me about. I said, okay, Stanley, I, I understand that. I, I get that in some way. But you can't rob people. Weren't you, weren't you afraid? Your, mother, your, your mother's going to lose you. Weren't you afraid of the police? Weren't you afraid of prison and, and getting indicted and all these things? And, he's, and in that moment, I got the most useful piece of legal education I've ever received. He said, is that what you think? Is that what you think, bro? Do you think that when I was out there robbing those men, prison at all entered my mind? I was worried about my mother dying. That meant, prison meant nothing to me. Do you think that when my friends put guns in their pants to go to school, they're all thinking about 18 months in the house of correction? They're thinking about making it to school without dying. The criminal laws for the land of the living, bro. We're out here trying to survive. God, if somebody had just told me that in law school. The best piece of legal education I got came not from the $150,000 piece of paper hanging <coughs> on my wall. It came from a 17-year-old kid sitting in handcuffs with a fifth grade reading education because I listened to the impacted party. I said, okay, Stanley, I understand that. I reached out of my pocket, pulled out my shield and my sword. I said, here's what's gonna happen today, Stanley. Right now, I need you to tell me what it is that you want. He said, I wanna, go to, I wanna graduate from high school. Nobody in my family's graduated from high school before. I wanna play baseball. I'm really good at baseball but I can't stay on the team because my grades aren't any good. I'm really smart, but everybody treats me like shit because of my family. And now I want to go to college. At the end of college, either way, if I have a job or if I'm playing pro ball, I just want to buy my mother a house and get her out the hood. Does that sound to anyone like a violent serial criminal that needs to be in prison for the next 50 years of his life. It didn't to me either. And I wanted to protect him from that. So I said, all right, Stanley, write a list of the things that you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be. And I'm going to write my list to get you from where you are to where you're going to be. There's some things I need from you. So Stanley wrote his list. Go to school every day, do my homework, Go to bed early, be nice to my mom, be nice to my friends, be nice to my neighbors, eat well, sleep a good night's sleep, drink milk, things you would think a 17-year-old boy would write down when he's writing his life plan. Mine looks remarkably the same. 
except at the top was you're going to get the victim stuff back tonight. You know where it is, we're going to get it back. Number two, you're going to apologize and not like I'm sorry. Every day from now until I say stop, you're going to be doing something to show that you understand and you're repairing the harm that you caused to those men, to those communities, to your community, to men that look like you. Every day you're going to be doing something to atone for this. You're going to participate in restorative justice with them if they choose to, and with surrogates even if they don't choose to. You're going to do community service until your eyes bleed. And you're not going to do it alone, I'm going to be there. Any documentary I'm going to see that I want you to see, you're going to come. Any academic lecture I'm going to that I want you to see, you're going to come. Any networking event that I go to, I want you to be at, you're going to come. And the day that you move into college, we can dismiss this case. That was me exercising my shield and my sword. Stanley walked out that day. Each one of you, just by virtue of the fact that you are in this room, has the power to make a difference in someone's life because of your shield and your sword. All you got to do is find it. Check your barometer for how brave you are when you use it. And check in with yourself every day when you wake up. What am I going to do today to make someone's life better? And at the end of the day, just check in and say, did I do it? And if not, I got to double down one. Because Stanley is representative of thousands of people that I've met, millions of people that I haven't, and tens of millions of people who have churned through the system forever. Stanley's story goes something like this. What we know now is that children who are conceived to mothers who live in stressful environments inherit that toxic stress. It changes the way their DNA forms, it changes the way their brain forms, it affects everything about that child as they're developing. That is an unborn child telling us, if you don't do something now, I'm going to go to prison. Because what we know now is that you can track that change in that development to state prison. Those children are then born into the environments where their mothers are suffering that toxic stress. And just because they are no longer developing fetuses, they're now developing children, the impact of that toxic stress actually goes up. You learn 90% of the stuff you're ever going to need before the age of three. And during that period of time, if you're also learning about trauma and abuse and neglect and malnutrition, that sinks into your DNA. That is part of your core fiber. In fact, 75% of the kids who are locked up in DYS in this state have had, on average, three interactions with the child welfare system before the age of three. 75% of the kids who are locked up in DYS in this state had on average three interactions with the child welfare system before the age of three. <coughs> Those are non <non-verbal> verbal <coughs> children telling us, if you don't do something different, if you don't use your shield and your sword differently, if you don't create something or think about something different, I'm going to go to prison. Those children then go on to the first grade, and by the time they reach the first grade, those children have heard, have been read to, on average, 18 hours from zero to six. Compared to kids from just marginally more affluent neighborhoods, <coughs> who by the time they've reached the first grade have been read to on average 2,400 <coughs> hours. Put another way, the kids from the communities that I prosecuted in heard 30 million less words by the time they reached the first grade the kids in the community just over the bridge. That gap in cognitive development, that gap in literacy, that gap in frankly give, showing a kid you give a shit enough to sit down with them and read and love them, leads to early interaction with the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, adult justice system, and prison. Those kids then go into middle school, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, and they've been receiving the same message every day. You don't matter. You're a problem. You're a bad kid. Why did they get that message? Because at those ages, they can't tell you that they can't read. They can't tell you they're suffering with trauma. They can't tell you they're, they're suffering with stress. Not because they're black or brown or dumb or migrant or poor or anything. Because they're children. They literally cannot conceive of why is it that I'm so frustrated right now. 
And it's because they can't learn from reading, having not learned the ability to learn to read. And so that behavior manifests itself. They act up, they act out, or they don't act at all. They fall asleep, they run around, they're in the hallways, they're the problem. And we, as adults, what do we do at that period of time? Do we apologize? Do we do everything we can to get that kid into a place where they feel comfortable and safe and ready to learn? No. We do what every child psychologist and brain development scientist would say not to do. We shame them, we punish them, we suspend them, we expel them, we reiterate the message they've heard literally since they were fetuses, you matter less. We don't have time for you. We don't have the resources for you. You're the bad kids, those are the good kids, those are the good kids, those are the good kids. And they hear this message every single day they go back to this place. Until they hit this period of our life that we love to refer to as adolescence when we're trying to find out who it is that we are. And all the messages that they are getting is that you suck. From their parents, from their teachers, from the cops, from everybody, you suck, you suck, you suck. Until they reach the age where we give them the autonomy to decide if they want to come back to this place anymore. And a lot of them say, you know what? No. I'm not learning anything. All I'm doing is getting in trouble. Everyone hates me. I'm not coming back here. And what do we do as adults? We do everything we can to get them back because we know if they do that, their lives are doomed. Nope. You're a dropout. You gotta worry about these good kids. 70% of the men who are incarcerated in prison right now are high school dropouts. 70%. It's a causal relationship. And then these dropouts, these losers, they go out and do something completely wild. They go out and they look for other people who are just like them. Other people who have been told for their lives, you suck, you don't matter, nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, and they find each other in the streets. And for the first time in their lives, they feel love and loyalty and respect and brotherhood. They feel like somebody loves them, loves them enough to care about them, loves them enough to kill for them. And that reciprocates. And then we put them in an environment where it's easier to get a handgun than it is to get a job. And when they finally go out and do that thing, not because they're bad, not because they're evil, because somebody has threatened the only person that has shown them love. And they responded to that with violence, the violence that they've learned since they were children. When they do that thing, then we say as adults, okay, now I have all the time, all the money, all the resources to arrest, prosecute, and incarcerate you for the rest of your life. Shame on you. Even though if we had taken one year of cost of that imprisonment and put it up right when that baby was starting to form, we could have prevented the whole problem in the first place. Each one of you has the opportunity, regardless of what you do coming out of here. I don't care if you go to be a mergers and acquisitions attorney or a veterinarian, there are places for all of us to engage children, young people, people who don't live in our communities to disrupt this pipeline that it takes an hour of your time, maybe. You go read to a school before you go to work for 30 minutes to a bunch of elementary school kids, you are fixing the word gap. 30 minutes, that's all they'll give you. Each one of you has the opportunity to do it. So are you going to? Because here's what can happen. Shortly before my meeting with the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, if you didn't catch that when I was bragging. <laughs> Shortly before that meeting, I sat down for a much more important meeting. I got to sit next to a young man as he signed his letter of intent to play Division Three baseball at a school in New Hampshire. A month and a half later, I got a text message from that young man. He said, I did it. He said, what'd you do, Stanley? Mm. Stanley, had become the first freshman in Division Three baseball history to start in the national championship game as a freshman pitcher. He pitched for eight innings, 11 strikeouts, two hits, and sealed his fate that year as the number one pitcher in the country for strikeouts as a freshman. 
And number six, overall for ERA. Pro scouts were at the game. Stanley will play pro ball. I don't care. What I care more about is that a few months later, Stanley sent me another text message. I think somebody's playing a trick on me, bro. Why do you think that, Stanley? Somebody had slid a letter under Stanley's door, and he opened it and it said he had made honor roll. And I said, why do you think somebody's playing a trick on you? And he said, bro, I've never seen a C. Not even a gym. I've never seen a C on my report card, let alone A's and B's. So I pushed him a little. I said, why do you think that is? He's like, well, the work, I mean, the work's hard. It's not like I'm, I'm getting a free pass, but it's my environment. And I said, talk to me about that. He's like, New Hampshire sucks, but. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I feel like people care about me. When I'm not doing well, teachers aren't punishing me. They're trying to help me. There aren't police officers, probation officers breathing down my neck waiting for me to do something wrong. There are people who care about me. And then a few months later, I got another text asking for money. Because Stanley didn't want to come home at the end of the school year. He wanted to take summer classes because he's going to change his major to criminal justice because he thinks he has something to teach people. So I gladly sent him that money. All of you have the power to do that. Right now, tonight, <coughs> tomorrow, even if it's engaging someone in a conversation that is uncomfortable, even if it's reading something you wouldn't think about reading and passing it on to somebody else that definitely wouldn't read it, even if it's watching a documentary with your parents who are on the other side of this conversation, even if it's visiting a jail or a prison, we know that just human contact inside of a jail or a prison makes the likelihood that somebody recidivate go down. Even if it's reading to children in a classroom, even if it's volunteering at a domestic violence shelter, even if it's volunteering at a homeless shelter. There's little bits and pieces of each one of us just picking up a bit of this social contract and we fix things for everyone. Because in 50 years from now, we're gonna be looking back on this period of time, and people are gonna be like, how could you let that happen? How could you let that happen? The most incarcerated planet, a country on the planet? Sending kids to the uh, gas chamber until 2006? Allowing life without parole for 15 year old children? How could you have let that happen? And at that period in time, you're gonna have two choices in my mind. Because as Martin Luther King said, in the future, it's not the words of your enemies that you remember. To silence your friends. So in 50 years from now, when somebody asks you that question or asks your loved one that question, how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as someone who heard all of this, <clears throat> saw all of this, watched it every day, knew you had that shield in your sword and just wanted to protect yourself, remain silent? Or do you want to be someone who said, yeah, no, I I saw that, I heard about that, and every day I woke up committing myself to do something about it. Every night I checked in with myself, asking myself if I had done it. Was I visiting, was I volunteering, was I corresponding, was I voting, was I watching, was I sharing? I used my shield and my sword, I was one of the next civil rights leaders of my time. I guarantee you, if you do that, if you join my gang, you'll be a richer, happier person wherever you are in 50 years from now than you can possibly imagine. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Have some Q&A before he takes off. Can you give a Yes, thank you. Um, I really want you to join my gang. And I don't use that word lightly. Um, we've, we, I'm taking back the word because we've made it something that it's not. Gangs are organizations that thrive on the bonding, brotherhood, loyalty, connection to a common purpose of people. That's it. If you want to join my gang, cool. You can do it by following me on Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Uh, Adam John Foss is my name. It's the most milk toast name on the planet. Um, but I also love helping people that are part of the crew. And so if you want to reach out and have a call, 
ask about anything we talk about, I prefer that you ask it in this room, so, you know, <laughs> not 40 people email asking the same question. Um, even if it's just like, listen, I don't, I don't agree with all that, I'd love to talk to you about that. Perfect, I love that. <coughs> but it's also my Gmail, so just reach out. Adam John Foss, my Gmail. Yes, sir. Oh, Nick, um, I really like everything you said, but I also like to like, say, like, uh, don't you think the family courts and the welfare system um, also really screwed black men? Totally. Yeah. Totally. I mean, so here's like, so here's what I do now. I, I took all this stuff, and I, I've now I train prosecutors. Um, I like disabuse them of everything they learned in law school and then teach them this whole other stuff. Uh, because it's crazy that I went to law school and took the same classes as you guys and I walked out and some of my friends went to be tax attorneys, some of my friends went to be corporate attorneys and I chose this job where the first day of work I was asking for people to go to jail. And I looked around and I just see all this carnage and I'm like, wait, all of these people that are around me want to do a good thing. Like we're trying to do a good thing. But we were never educated about how to do that good thing. We were just told, like, stand over here for the bail argument. Here are your cases. Um, do this, do that. And, you know, count the number of guilties on this thing, and that's your bail amount. It's like, what? It's ridiculous. And then when I started thinking about it, I thought about all the other public institutions that were interconnecting with the folks that I was seeing in the, in the criminal justice system. And what was true of all those people, child welfare workers, social workers, probation officers, public school teachers, doctors, <laughs> None of those pe people go to the job being like, I really want to bust the parts of families. I really, really love mass incarceration. I want to contribute to it. We, we don't go in doing that. We go in wanting to do this thing, but our jobs just have not been innovated. And so when I think about child welfare, and I, I talk to my friends in the child welfare system, I'm like, all they talk about is how shitty the job is. I'm like, yeah, that's because we're trying to solve problems the same way we have since the beginning of time. And until we like think about Jesse and I were talking about this on the way up here. It's like the fact that I'm still writing on manila folders in the courtroom in 2018 is crazy to me. In fact, the newest prosecutors uh, in law offices or DA's offices around the country, the only time they use a pen is when they're s standing in the courtroom. Everything in their, their life has been digitized. And so why are we not inputting information into a tablet that then goes somewhere that I can then use and look at and see, is this working, is this not working? I can track what we're doing, I can report about it, I can look at it, I can have analysts look at it. It's crazy. Yes? I find um, that the system, in, in, the, in a sense, is uh, made so that it gets exactly the people that are affected there. And I think in Massachusetts, thinking about Stanley, the fact that we don't have bilingual education anymore gets them to that point where, why would I be in school? If anyone here had to go to school and listen to someone that's speaking Chinese or mm -hmm. something, isn't that we're stupid? Yeah. No, we don't understand. Yeah, I was in, I was in uh, the Department of Youth Services the other day with the pretrial detention population. And we were all circled up, having to talk with the young people. Um, immediately I knew that the, the, the workers there, again, to your point, it was just like, you, you want me to, first of all, you asked me to go in and tell them to stop committing gang violence. Um, then you, you circle them up with each other and all the adults that work in here, and you, you want them to open up about gang violence in front of you. And so we're, we're talking, we're having this like dog and pony show of a conversation. And I look over and I see this young um, brown male just sort of like checked out just checked out, he's sort of leaning over in his chair, and I'm trying to engage all the youth, and so I walk over to the young man, and I say, what do you think? And um, everybody starts laughing, including the adults. And they say, he doesn't speak any English. And I was like, we've been sitting here for an hour, an hour, talking, and, and this young man doesn't speak any, he doesn't know what's happening, and, and they're like, no, we don't, have, we don't have a translator here. And I was like, do you know how torturous that must be for this young man who has, I mean, and so I, I started asking about this young man. He was from El Salvador. Uh, because of the violence in El Salvador, he and a bunch of other young men, not his family, a bunch of other young men, came through Mexico where they met his family. They tried to make the crossing, only he and two other boys made it. And then somehow, with the other boy, he made it up to Massachusetts where there's a large El Salvadorian population. He'd been here for five months. 
He was arrested for trespassing because he was sleeping in somebody's basement. Nobody could find anything about, out about him, so we placed him in incarceration. Not understanding at all the trauma that this kid has suffered, not just through his entire life, but on the, on the crossing. And here he is, sitting in a place where nobody speaks his language. And we're wondering why he will run from a foster home if we put him there. And somehow, our response to that is, well, he should learn English. When nobody in the rest of the world has that much bravado or ignorance about their country. And I'm just watching this thing happen because all these people want to do a good thing. They want for this kid to be safe. They want it for him to be happy. And yet something just like the basic comfort that, it, that a young person can have in somebody who's speaking his language is lost on them. Because we don't understand trauma. We don't understand poverty. We spend our time in this place learning about torts and the model penal code and property law when really we should be learning about human behavior. As a prosecutor, my job is just about human behavior. If somebody does something, I'm supposed to intervene so their behavior changes. I never learned anything about human behavior. The largest population of people that I will face <coughs> in the criminal justice system in terms of age, the largest cohort, the most violent, the most volatile, the most amenable to treatment are adolescents. You know what's something I never learned about in law school? Adolescents. <laughs> Nothing. And so there we are, dealing with young people who are doing bad things and treating them the same way that we treated witches during the Salem witch trials. I want you to go home and turn on the crucible and fast forward to the court scene. And then I want you to go home, and then I want you to turn on Law and Order and fast forward to the court scene. And just take a look at how we're doing the exact same thing. Even though right now, I could get a movie, get a burrito, and get a ride all from my cell phone. It's despicable that we have let the entire world innovate and mobilize, but the people who are stuck in the criminal justice system and child welfare system and the shit public school system, we've just let them flounder because they're less valuable to us. More questions? Yes, sir. Would you recommend any, uh, any books that would expose us to these types of concepts? How do we well, maybe there's like a, some type of a strategy or an idea of how to uh, reform the system as it is now? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my strategy. Uh, but there's lots of books. I don't know that there's like a strategy book, but there's lots of books we should be reading in here that would actually teach us not only um, useful things for practicing law, but also would teach us history in a real way. Would teach us lots about science. Would teach us lots about data, economics. All of these things that would be useful to us instead of the rule of perpetuities or against perpetuities, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can send. I can send you a list. I'll okay. send. I'll send Jesse a list, and he can distribute it because I actually have a growing list of, of books, articles, video content, podcasts. Um, here's my strategy for ending mass incarceration, and this will be my pitch to all of you who are thinking about going into criminal justice world. Um, when we say mass incarceration, we often think about that number that I started with, 2.3 million. Holy shit, that's bad. Really high, we're the highest in the world, that's awful. Um, mass incarceration is not about that number. It's awful, it's bad, but 650,000 people come out every year, okay? Mass incarceration is not a retention problem. It's an admission problem. And when you just like frame it like that, you're like, all right, 650,000 people coming out every year. If the number is this, if we stop with this, then this number goes down. So you're like, all right, well, who can admit people to prison? Who has the physical and legal ability and capacity to admit people to prison? Judges. Judges and? Juries. No. Prosecutors. Prosecutors. Prosecutors get a pass, but we are basically the people who are incarcerating people. We set up plea bargains with our charging power. Very rarely will you ever see a judge disagree with our sentence recommendation because that puts them in the line of fire. 
We asked for bails on the regular, which just starts the progression into jail. Prosecutors are the ones for putting people in a jail or prison. And so when you find out that it's prosecutors who are putting people in jail or prison, you ask yourself, what is their incentive to do so? What is the incentive for me as a prosecutor to put somebody in jail? Steve? What is it? Is it promotion? It's, for, it's for promotions. It's for promotions. And not in like this sinister way where we come in and it's like there's a chart with like how hard can you bounty hunt. It's literally because we don't measure anything else. We don't have any way to measure anything else. So what do we measure? How long have you been here? How many trials have you had? How many of them ended in conviction? And then like these intangibles like do people like you? The defense bar like you, the judges like you. None of those metrics matters at all to whether or not we are increasing public safety, making victims satisfied, or making people whole again, which are our stated values. So the question is, if the metrics for which by we are promoted have nothing to do with the stated values, then why are they so incentivizing? And it's because we don't measure anything that looks like these values over here. And so part of the solution is, well, maybe we should start measuring things, things that matter. Like, how much, person, how much housing does this person have when they were caught committing the crime? And how much housing do they have now? Where were they at in their education cycle, the beginning of this prosecution? Where are they at now? And you go down the line of those sort of six safety metrics I talked about and start incentivizing people to do those things. For example, in, in when I took with the uh, juvenile unit in Boston, I cared less about trials. Don't, I don't, trials are a waste of time. Tremendous waste of time. Aaron Hernandez, three and a half weeks of trial, not guilty, dude kills himself, nobody's happy. And we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to make that happen. So instead of trials, why don't we start measuring how many young men and women are graduating from high school while you are prosecuting them? That is a metric. Because we force it all the time. We wait until probation. We say, go to school every day, get a degree. We do it all the time that way. But we haven't thought creatively about like, when is the best time to start implementing that, measuring it. Can you talk about your experience with the restorative justice program? Yeah, yeah. So the only thing that I've found in the criminal justice system that is close, without sort of getting into the measurement and all that, that is close to our stated intended values is restorative justice. Um, restorative justice is, hits all of the things that we say we do as prosecutors. Accountability, safety, making victims whole, and repairing communities. And that's because it's developmentally appropriate. It's, huma it's humanitarian. And so uh, the week of the marathon bombing, like, or the week after the marathon bombing, um, these five young people who went to high school on the Northeastern campus, there's a high school on the Northeastern campus, walked into the high and walked into the student center at Northeastern. One of them was dressed in a suit and had a briefcase. The rest of them just sort of like scattered around, took out their camera phones. And the one in the, the one with the briefcase went up to a young woman sitting at a table, put the briefcase down next to her and said, you have 60 seconds to decide what you want to do with your life, and he ran away. And all his friends were recording this happening. And they were doing what it turned out which they would later go to put on YouTube because other kids were doing it. It was funny. And I was watching that video, that recording, of the woman's face who was sitting there with this thing next to her a week after the marathon bombing, not even a mile away from school. And that was like some of the worst victimization I had ever seen, to be honest. Um, I'd never seen fear like that. I'd never seen terror like that. And um, she ran, called police, please cut these kids, because they're kids, um, and arrested them. The Northeastern Police Department, forever I will be grateful to them, because they said, you know, like, if we charge them with what we could charge them with, it would read um, um, terrorist attack and bomb threat and all of these really bad words in the criminal record. So we want to ask you what we can do other than this. And I said, this sounds like a pretty good case for restorative justice. Um, so we rounded up the kids, uh, asked the victim 
part to participate, but by this time she had left school. She was that traumatized that she left the Northeastern campus. Um, and so I said, okay, I need to go get some surrogate people to sit in her place. So I went out and got survivors in the marathon body to come in and sit in the circle with these boys. I got their parents, I got some students at Northeastern, and I got um, the investigating officers on the case. And they had all sort of like, you have to go through facilitation before you get to this meeting, you know, just put all these people in a room, you have to, there's a trained professional who's talking to all these groups. And finally we came together for the final circle conference. And for three hours, I saw all of these things happen that I had never once seen in a courtroom. I saw people being actually accountable for the crime that they had committed. Like, real accountability. And I thought about all of those guys that had pled out to cases because we had like, ticky-tack mitigated down to something, and they took responsibility sort of for something, but it was, it was bargained for. I thought about all those people who, after trial, when they're convicted, the first thing they do is file their notice of appeal. I thought about all the men and women they visited in prison who were like, the first question they're asking is, how do I get out of here? That's not accountability. It's never been accountability. What I was seeing in this room was accountability, the weight of the harm that you have caused sitting on you to the point where you break down and you cry. And it's not just about the acute harm that you've caused to this person, it's about the harm that you've caused to all these people. Your parents, who've given up everything to be here to give you an education. The Dominican people who now have to walk around this campus and get looked at sideways because of your behavior. The investigating officers who have to struggle between what's best for you and what's best for this college campus. And these people who just literally last week had their lives ripped apart by somebody who wasn't playing around with a briefcase. Seeing that happen. And then seeing the rebuilding of that and talking about like, what are we gonna do to repair this harm? Long story short, a year later, uh, two of those boys um, were still employed by the one fund in Boston. Uh, all five of the boys are now in college. And uh, after a year and a half, the victim reached out to me to ask what happened to the boys, and she has a relationship with two of them now. Because after sort of the thing happened, um, she was able to forgive, and I guarantee you that forgiveness, just the act of forgiveness, um, takes up a lot more, a lot less emotional capacity than vengeance. <coughs> and we have been tricked into believing that the only way to make us feel better in this country is by sending someone away forever. And what's crazy about that is one, it's scientifically wrong. It's scientifically wrong. But two, we're the only country in the world that does it. And so while it's, while it's a concept that it's difficult to like talk about and listen to, and it's like belies sort of where we are um, as, a, as a country, if we just talk about it more and participate in it more, it's like, oh, this is what I want. Every summer, and, and now every month, I sit with a group of 30 young men in prison, in Norfolk State Prison. They're juvenile lifers, so they all committed their crimes before they were eight, uh, 17. They all committed murders. Uh, every single one of them uh, is black or brown with the exception of one dude, one white kid who strangled his girlfriend to death. Everyone else was a shooter or a stabber. And sitting with these young men who have been doing restorative justice work for seven years, I cannot find a one of them, except maybe the kid who strangled his girlfriend, who I'm like, you're ready to be out here. And they'll tell you, when I did that crime, I should have gone to prison. They're not talking about, they're not talking the ways that other people talk to me in prison. They're like, no, I should have come here. I should have been penalized. But in that entire time, I've been doing programming, I've gotten my education, I've been doing a sort of justice work, I have forgiven myself for the harm that I've caused, I've forgiven others for the harm that they caused me. And when I talk to these men, I'm like, God, you should be the ones who are teaching law school classes. You should be the ones who are doing police academy training. You should be the ones who are doing the work that I'm doing now. Because if I had listened to you, and every single one of you tell your story, that pipeline story that I tell, I got that from dudes in prison. And that's what we should be aiming for for a criminal justice system is, when I'm 17 and you give me a life sentence, that's 17 years. That's not 80. Because after a while, all of the things that we think we're achieving by this long sentence run out. And so that we're, just, we're, we're just paying for people. We're just paying for you to be there. And I would be on board with it if somebody else did it, but they don't. I'd be on board with it if we, our incarceration rate was super low, but it's not. I'd be on board with it if our crime rate was low, but it's not. Who else? 
Yes, sir. I was uh, just going to ask, uh, the question itself is like, what made you choose and what made you continue to choose uh, prostitutorial work as opposed to like going into defense? Because just, just a little concept, uh, to give it a little context, I originally wanted to be a prosecutor, but uh, I interned for a judge for about a month and I saw how things were going and I instantly switched to defense. And the two biggest challenges I faced were, one, I felt like I could, I wanted to go into the system and create a change, but I felt like it was almost near impossible to do. And second, my own community was giving me backlash for even trying to decide yep. to go that route. So I was just curious of what prepares yep. you. Um, I tried the defense thing. Um, I tried it. And I found myself running around asking a bunch of people for things, including people who were younger than me, who had lived tremendously different lives than the, than the men and women that I was representing, being super smug in my face, like just talking about days and weeks and years in prison as if they were not real, as if, you know, somehow it was going to be better life for the person who was committing crime. And um, I just never wanted to be in that position of having to ask. Uh, and as a prosecutor, I just got to make the decision. It's like, oh, I don't, Stanley, nope, you're not going in. Um, and the concept, the other concept, the other, the other thing that's difficult is like, there's this narrative that like, you have no discretion. And I walked, in the, I walked into my office with the same thing, you have no discretion. And then I realized like, if I, if I had to ask permission for every decision that I make, and if all the other people that were around me had to ask for permission for every decision that they made, this place would fall apart. We don't have to like decide whether or not we're gonna prosecute Stanley for an armed robbery. We can decide at the beginning when we're new, can I go over and say hello to this person, and explain to them who I am, what's gonna happen. That, you're already making a difference in that person's life. Already making a difference. You're making a different experience for that person. Do I talk to their family members and say, hey, I'm about to get up here. I'm about to breed allegations in a police report, and they're just that, they're allegations. I have to do my job and ask for this bail. But I would love to talk to you about a way that we can get this bail down and, and return this person safely to your home, because I don't want them locked up. I know that walking them up is bad for me. And radically changing people's experience at court. And then as a new person, you can do other things like create programs. I started a reading program in elementary schools in Dorchester for people literally before they went to work. On the way to work, Stop this elementary school, we'll read to half, for a half hour, we'll go to school. We start with four prosecutors in one school. We're up to 60 prosecutors in 11. And what is that doing? Just that little interaction in the mornings, every Wednesday morning, and now it's Wednesday and Thursday morning, what is that doing? Closing the literacy gap. Uh, reducing implicit bias in the prosecutors. Reducing implicit bias in those children. Showing those children role models that don't look like them, but are somehow in their community and they they ask questions of what that person is doing. You're also creating relationships that have time and time again paid off whether the person is the young person or a witness, a victim or a defendant. Seeing people in the grocery store or on the street and having a little kid run up to you and say, oh, Mr. Foss, Rapunzel is what they call me, whatever. Rapunzel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, you're, like, you're just making all these things happen and guess what, your boss loves that shit. And so I just have the boss in and I'll be like, yeah, selfie, done, on the website, and now it's on to the next thing. Okay, we got the little kids out of the way. Now let me start walking, working with these young men in a different way. We, we operate with discretion in, in our mind. Like, um, when I think about those people who, I'm flying all the time, I think about those people who are like clutching the seat next to me on the airplane. And I'm like, let me, let me ask you, how did you get to the airport? And they're like, oh, I drove. I was like, were you doing this in the car? And they're like, no. I was like, you realize 80,000 people died in car accidents last year, zero died in plane crashes. And they're like, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> like this idea, this idea that what we're doing is the right thing, and it's the safest thing, is that it's, it's the same, it's the same asinine conversation I have with the person on, on, the, on the airplane. To continue to send people, particularly young people, into incarceration, over and over and over again to make it safer is the risk. That's the risk. Not sending Stanley to jail while it was a risk. He could have gone out and killed someone, but he didn't. That's like the plane crash. In fact, what do you call it? What's the, like, the phenomenon when you take a risk on somebody, they go out, they do something bad, and it blows back in your face and it makes it look really bad? Happened in this state. 
1988 presidential election. Willie Horton. Oh. Willie Horton. Whenever any, anybody says, well, what, what happens if you have a Willie Horton? And what I say to them is, do you know when that happened? And they're like, yeah, Dukakis Bush. I was like, yeah, but what year was that? Like 1988. And I was like, don't you think that if this was such a problem, if this was such a risk, that we'd have a new name? <laughs> that happened 30 years ago. And yes, it does happen. It is going to happen. The question that we have to ask ourselves is for how long will we allow the rest of the shit to happen to protect against that than just radically switching it, understanding that the bad things are still going to happen. It's about harm reduction at this point. Worst crime rate in the world because of drugs and, and stealing and stuff like that. Highest incarceration population in the world. At the most cost in the world. And we have 70% recidivism. When are we going to take a step back and be like, uh, something, there might be a better answer out there. And so like, I say all of that to say, this concept of discretion is just like, one, I often ask young people when they tell me that, I'm like, how do you know? Like, well, you know, that's what everybody said when I got here. And I was like, yeah, did you try? No. Uh, go out and try. And then if somebody gives you shit, you have a pretty good argument to construct to say, you know what, boss, with all due respect, like, the fact that you've been here for six months longer than me does not make you smarter than me or give you more judgment about what is fair. You don't say it like that, because that would give you problems. <laughs> um, but there are lots of ways to make the argument, and that's what we're here for, to say, let's just try something different. And here are some examples of where it's happening. And just make them feel better, because when that thing happens, when Stanley pitches in the game, my DA takes credit for that. All right? Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that really spoke to me, and I've been thinking about this all week, but you mentioned it again earlier on in your talk about how, <coughs> you know, early on in, you know, passage of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act, you know, what were you doing then, you know, when people couldn't go eat at stores and restaurants, like when schools were completely segregated, what were you doing then, you know, when there were underground railroads, what were you doing then? And I think, and then you th talk about statistics today in which we are more segregated in schools when, you know, voting rights are even more unequal today than they are back then. You know, that same question persists. What are you doing now versus, you know, to fix these things? What are you doing now to help out and to stop modern civil rights violations? Um, and then I think about my own particular gang, <laughs> in my own particular circumstances, in my worldview, in my society, in the, and it is nothing like the people that I am, you know, that we're studying and that we're going out there. I, you know, my, one of my best friends is a tech CEO. You know, I live in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. Uh, all, most of my friends are ex very wealthy by relative measure. Um, and I think, you know, in my world, personally, what do I do to stem those the tide of those violations when I do not live in that world. I do not associate in that world, right? Because we're talking about race, we're talking about economics, we're talking about class and all those things. And if I don't live in that world, where do I come fit in to change those things if those things are happening? And it's an easy answer to be like, you know, oh, you know, we need to help voting rights or we need to help, you know, access education and things like that. But the, the problems today, in my opinion, again, are nuanced, they're systemic, they are, uh, you know, they are minor in the sense to me and major to others, you know, and I am finding ways to battle those difficult and to understand. And so, I don't know, I'm wondering how to help in that sense. Yeah, um, I get to spend most <laughs> of my time with really, really wealthy white people um, who care so much about these issues. And non-ironically, we will have our this is, this is the list of places that I've been the last year with like the most wealthy white people who talk about these problems and have the money, have the money collectively and individually to solve these problems. Here we go. Vancouver, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Palo Alto, Santa Barbara, what am I missing? Sicily? Yep. Those are where we have met to discuss these problems. And it's like, do you not see the irony and the fact that we have picked the most elite 
places. And look around you, there are no black people here. Like, when you say, I live in this world, no, 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 we live in the same world. We've just made it impossible for people to penetrate. Why? Because we feel like we're losing something. Until you are prepared to say, I'm, I am ready to give something up that I have, even if it's my precious time, then that's gonna be a very hard question for you to answer. Particularly hard for your friends who aren't here, who aren't doing this. But until people get their faces shoved in it and stop thinking about like, how do I get into that world? Just go, just go. On Saturday or Sunday morning, just go. I don't care if you walk around Dudley Station and just talk to people. Ask them questions like, if you had all the money in the world, because I fucking do, what would you do with it? I was, in, I was in Philadelphia last week meeting with the DA's office. And they were like, yeah, we're new, we're innovative, we want to try everything, da da da. And so I was like, I would love to go see the um, family court, juvenile court, family court. So we walk, oh, it's a brand new building. It's brand new building, right, right over here, brand new building. It's awesome. I walk in and I was like, this, this is the place that you built for family fucking court? Do you know anything about architecture? You know anything about like <laughs> colors and, and anything about like comfort design? Nothing? Cool. So then we walk up to the floor where everybody waits for their court date, and it looks like this. Same thing, black chairs in rows and people just sitting there waiting. And when I got there at like 9.30, I saw um, a young mother with three children and who appeared, someone who appeared to be a grandmother. And so I went to the court, I did some observation, I came back out. Two hours later, she's still sitting there. And these kids are out of control. Not because they're bad, um, but because they're nine, seven, and two, and they've been asked to sit in the same boring Board. fucking area Board. for hours. So I go up to the, so I asked the, uh, the person who's giving me the tour, I was like, do you ever talk to any of the folks out here? See what they need? I'm like, why would we do that? We have this <laughs> sweet new building. I was like, all right, watch this. So I, I go over to the grandmother, who, you know, like, isn't the most polished person in the world. She's not wearing super nice clothes, but I guarantee you she's the smartest person in this hallway. And I say, if you had all the money in the world, save the fact that you have to be here. Like, we can't do anything about that yet. You have to be here. How, what would you do to make your time feel more worthwhile here? And she was like, honey. And she just started listing off brilliant shit that if she was sitting down with the design of this building, we'd have a much more functional building. She was like, first of all, it's really dehumanizing when you're coming to a place because you have problems to have to cattle line through a metal detector. That's really dehumanizing. And it already starts your day off wrong. And then we come up to this place and nobody gives us any guidance except to sit here. We check in and it says, go sit down. So we sit here not knowing when we're, we're gonna be called. And it's as if we don't have anything else to do with our lives because we're unemployed. When in actuality, like, because I'm unemployed, all of my time is very valuable. Like, I need to be getting a job. And she said, my, my granddaughter here, the young mother, doesn't have a job, is having a problem with this, having a problem with that. And instead of dealing with those issues in this building, she has to sit here in a chair. And these children, they should be at school. But I know that they can't go to school because she doesn't have childcare. So isn't there a room, one of these rooms that's empty that we can use for some sort of like learning experience for them? It doesn't have to be like math, reading, and writing, but something to help them with the trauma that they're dealing with? And why isn't there a place for, for us to get like healthy snacks? It's just this vending machine that's gonna make my children fatter. <laughs> okay, now guess what, Mr. Private Sector, with all your money and all your care and all these things, here is a very, very, if, if you, I know that you can do it for cheap, and all of you can get the social impact, oh, I donated this and I donated that, let's do that. And we should have listened to this person and not whoever like RISD student you had build this fucking place. I just wanted to comment that um, I'm, I'm not a law person, I'm a psychiatric nurse. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having this and inviting the public. Um, but I try to, you know, as do what I can do where I'm at. And the first thing I do is to make sure I don't treat people like they're invisible. So that idea of finding out a person's story or seeing them in a situation and saying hello, I, I, you know, I, yeah. I, just making people feel comfortable where they're at 
The other thing is, is there are local programs where you can insert yourself like your reading program. Here is the SMILES program in this area, which I've been involved in. And you sit down with kids and you either read to them or you spend time with them. And I've seen public officials in Fall River um, come in and spend an hour with um, one, you know, some of the kids. So there are things that you can do, but I think making yourself available and finding a place where you can, you have to insert yourself. You, you may not find it in your own personal community. I live in Westport, which um, I don't know how many black families live in Westport. Yeah. There aren't that many. Um, so to insert yourself in cities where um, seeing someone who is available to make them feel like they're valued. Yeah. Making people feel like they're visible and valued are the two most important things we can do in any relationship and especially if you see somebody that you might be afraid of, that's the time where you have to go and say hello. And that's why I love the proximity to the jail here. Is yeah. It's absurd. You, you literally could change the world just by going down there instead of like trivia night or whatever you people do here. <laughs> My brother in the back had a comment as well. Yeah, I, um, it, was, it was funny listening to your story because I, I, I don't, I don't know about people's personal experiences with like mine, but I'm actually from the hood. Now, when I say I'm from the hood, like, I have friends who died, friends who chose games, and so, but you put a very humanizing aspect on a very um, difficult situation. And I am, I am fortunate um, because I, I actually had family who pushed me in a, in a different direction. But I had a, I had a mother who taught me to you know, sit down and told me to go, to go the other direction. But this is just like you were saying, like Stanley, when it comes to the kids going to jail, no one's thinking, no one's in the hood is thinking about 15 years to life. Like when your mama, when you see your mama not eating because she gave you the pack of ramen noodles, yes. um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go out on the street and I'm gonna get up to three o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna sell drugs. Cause I'm gonna walk in the next day and I'm gonna put 1500 on the table. Cause my mama, I don't care, my mama is not gonna eat. And I think people don't understand that. And just about what, like you talk about uh, Stanley saying his friends, you know, we gotta carry a gun just so we can get down the block. I don't, I don't, you know, the DA doesn't understand that when you get pulled over, like yeah. I got this gun for protection. Yeah. Um, and if I don't have this gun, then I'm dead. Yeah. And my mama's not gonna come to my funeral. And you know, so if I gotta do 15 years of life, I'm gonna say I'm gonna do 15, but I'm gonna die. Yeah. You know, um, but but that's you know, like people don't yeah. understand um, that struggle and then they don't understand the systematic um, just how systemic the, the racism and, and things are. Yeah. Uh, and and that's why you see these things happening in the hood. Um, and I think we can draw a parallel to what, what happened in South Africa with apartheid. They actually had a grieving um, process. When Nelson Mandela became president, they actually had grieving panels. People would go and they would make yep. restitution. Uh, but we never had any restitution in this country. And so there was never a public outcry and, and public grieving. And so when you post those pictures on the internet, people are shocked. Like, I didn't know this happened. There was never that, that grieving process, and there was never fixing of the system that keep people uh, in poverty. Yeah, people people actually have responded, and I've never seen that. Or yeah, but look at this, black on black crime. Yeah, but look at this, slavery in Libya. Yeah, but look at this, uh, welfare fraud. And to your point, and, and it goes back to the restorative justice question, it is because we have not had that we have not had that period of truth and reconciliation. And it doesn't just have to be like the ceremonial thing after the after Mandela is, is liberated. We can start like in elementary school classrooms, start actually teaching like real history, and stop like this idea that we have to protect children from the, the horrors of our past because it might screw them up. When I hear about people talk about, um, you know, don't you think don't you think he knew better than to pull out a gun? Like, are you asking me if he knew that it was wrong to open gun? Yes. But do I think that mattered in terms of his survival? No. When people talk to me about personal accountability and responsibility and choice, it angers me because I'm like, how much personal responsibility and accountability have you taken for the fact that you don't ever have to deal with carrying a firearm to feel safe? And one of the things, again, from, learning, from talking to impacted parties 
was in the meeting with the DYS kids a couple weeks ago. Um, one thing that I never put together in my own brain was, you know, like I'm not doing well in school because I'm not thinking about school at all. I'm thinking about the walk home. And that to me was just like, I, again, it was just like, yes, yeah, oh, okay. And so that frustration is not just that you don't know the subject matter. That frustration is not because you don't want to pay attention or just because you're a kid and school sucks. That frustration is also because every single day you have to take this journey where you might get killed, sit around for a while and wait for it on the way back. And you know you have to wake up and do that tomorrow. And then, because of old school policies in Boston, you have to do that for two hours a day. And these kids were just frustrated that they didn't understand why they had to get on, on a bus in Rosendale and go to school in East Boston. And just that frustration that nobody ever explained to them, and this is because of desegregation of schools in the 70s. That was frustrating to them. And it was just like, oh, we really need to be removing ourselves from this idea that we have the answers and those people are less than, and they need, we, they need our help. We actually should just be like, what can I do with my privilege to make sure that those people have all of the resources that they need to build out of this problem? All right, we gotta go. If you guys have more questions, feel free to plug them.